So the rules and the format is slightly different. Um, we're actually going to start up here um, because one of the things that I've uh, recognized in the past is that when we start out down there and have public comments, you're trying to turn your head and uh, you know um, be polite and look at the people that are speaking to you. So we're going to start here because uh, we will have public comments in the beginning. And then um, the council and other guests that have been invited to the table will uh, come down here because we do have some guests, including our attorney and uh, representatives from the Pine Point, um, things called the Pine Point Residents Association, if I got that right, will join us as well. So what I would like to do is to start, um, and if anybody uh, is watching, the reason, uh, so this is a workshop, um, we will actually do the Pledge of Allegiance at the start of the town, uh, the regular meeting, council meeting, so we will not do that here. And we won't do a roll call. We'll do an introduction when we're um, down there. But what I would like to do is open it up for public comment. Um, and just for the, this is a workshop um, regarding um, Avenue 2 um, and Paper Streets. Um, and Avenue 2, if you're not aware, is located down in the Pine Point area um, off of King Street. Um, so I'd like to open it up to public comment. If anybody would like to come up to the podium, you have uh, three minutes that you can address the council. There he is. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, good evening. My name is Philip Reed, and uh, I'm one of the people who was designated to uh, review the Second Avenue uh, Paper Street access. And uh, my main thrust here is to say that uh, I think it it should be incumbent upon the board or council, I guess it is, to uh, have their attorney do a full uh, search of the records uh, to get an independent uh, opinion uh, as to what the status is of the street. From what I can see from reading um, uh, the letter from uh, Mr. Gendron's attorney and uh, the town's attorney's uh, response, uh, it appears that he relied basically on what was provided to him uh, by Mr. Genron's attorney. And in that letter, he raised a couple issues. Uh, number one, um, the, the status of, uh, of the street, 2nd Avenue. Uh, I did some research. It's only 115 feet. The record length of that street is only 115 feet. Uh, it's not... Uh, I think it was 300 and something according to the agenda deed. So it's just a little piece of street. And it originally went up to the uh, sand dunes or the beach as it was in 1888. Uh, since that time, there's been an awful lot of accretion that's taken place on the ocean there. And now the, the shore is extended out from that line, I don't know, 200 feet. So... Uh, also, I'd like to point out that I looked at Mr. Genron's deed, and it appears that to me, as a layman, he's only got title to lot 15 on that 1888 plan. Uh, the back portion of his deed includes what is shown on the 1888 plan as beach land uh, open to the public. And as I went through his deed chain, uh, the, the, the deed into his predecessor and title, uh, used as a source of ownership an adverse possession claim. And there is no reference there as to whether or not uh, a court action had taken place to give him title to that land or not. So on the face of it, it looks to me like he's got a lot, which is 100 by 50 feet. Uh, excuse me, 115 feet back and 50 feet wide. Uh, and about 2nd Avenue uh, for only 115 feet. So, I mean, that needs to be cleared up. Uh, and then there's a question about two plans. Uh, that's, you know, even with my little research here, that's easily cleared up. And there's an affidavit which was uh, written in uh, uh, 1929 which explains why there are two plans. And... Uh, I'm, I'm sure the, the book and page will come up shortly. Uh, the actual right-of-way there, uh, Second Avenue, is not just a footpath. If you go and you look at it, there's non-native gravel in that, in that way there. 
and it extends back at least 115 feet back to where the original line would have been. Uh, there's also signs marking a public uh, way that the town has put up. There's no parking signs. Um, there's fences. There's fences on Mr. Johnron's line. And there, according to a 19, I think it was 63 plan, I'll have to verify that, there were fences on the other side. So it's delineated. And it's been used uh, by everybody the public, the people of, of Pine Point, uh, without uh, being told they can't use it. The uh, butters have never challenged their using it. So, I mean, it's been acquiesced to. There's, there's no two ways about it. So, anyhow, my, my thrust is here is that, you know, you need, the, in my opinion, you need to give the uh, town attorney uh, some, some time to actually do his own research. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Uh, one question, because we are re um, at least recording this. Um, in our rules, um, if you can also state your address. Yes, uh, four lane by the sea. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? If you'd like, you can uh, come up to the podium and uh, stand in line as well. <coughs> Each person's comments should be about three minutes. Um, my name is Pauline Levin, and I also live on Lane by the Sea. I'm number five. Uh, and in many ways, I'm, I'm both an old and a, well, I'm a recent addition to this community. And I identify it with very, very much with it because it's very similar to a community I lived in in New York that also had a waterfront on the Hudson River. But I think. Uh, and I also was on that town board, by the way. But I'm here to urge you to really protect the interests of all of the residents of Scarborough and not um, be penny wise and pound foolish, you know. It, I want to see you really investigate this and for once and all put it to rest. I want you to use all your energy <laughs> and your money, our money, to go to court if it's necessary because um, you can never replace this waterfront. And this waterfront is an attractive uh, recreational uh, place for everyone, both swimming and being on the sand, fishing, and I'm sure a lot of other towns nearby would envy us for having that and wish they had it. Don't give it away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Genevieve Johnson, uh, 320 Black Point Road. Um, to go off of what you were saying, I read through both attorneys' statements, and it appears murky is the, the language that is being used. And I think it is time for us to clarify and look for some common truth. We're in a, a time of a lot of murkiness and we need to be careful and decisive about what we do. There are two points that I want to make in this sense of clarity that we're looking for. It seems that we, we're approaching this without recognizing there are two issues we're talking about. The first is the public access to the beach that Pine Point residents and Scarborough residents and our visitors all enjoy. I bike across the Eastern Trail and down into Pine Point and I go down Avenue 2 to get to the, the Pine Point Beach. This summer I found out about this issue that it was in the town council because I stopped and I spoke with a police officer that was on patrol on Avenue 2 walking her route and she let me know about what was happening. So one thing to consider is how are we going to secure the access for our community? Vibrant communities need to support recreational access. The second issue that we need to consider is that what Mr. Gendron is asking for is more room so he can expand his property and therefore expand the house that's going to be on that property. 
So let's just be really clear when making our decisions that we understand both of those issues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is uh, John Barrett, and I own property on 4 Doonfield Lane, but I'm a person from away. So it's been hard to follow this, other than the good counselor here who's had meetings, Councillor Donovan, uh, down at the firehouse. And of course, a lot of the residents down there are away, whether it's the winter or like me, we own real estate in Massachusetts. So it does make it hard for us to follow a lot of this stuff. And one thing I noticed was that you had an executive session meeting. And I'll just ask the chairman, were there minutes taken of that meeting? You met with the town attorney. Is that correct? Yes. Were there minutes, minutes are not taken at any executive session meeting. What? Minutes are not taken at any executive so, session so meeting. So there is none. That's so we don't know if we ask for a copy, we don't know what went on. Correct. We don't know what, and I think as citizens and as landowners up here, we're entitled to know the opinion before we get into all of this of the town attorney. We haven't had that at this particular time. But I concur with the, with the other people that spoke here just a few minutes ago. It's a beautiful area. But one thing I do know, in my limited time up here, which has probably been over 15 years, that a lot of people use that. They use that pathway to go back and forth constantly. So, and from what I know, which is again limited, but what I know is that people have used it for many, many years, and nobody has made claim to to that. The abutters have never made uh, made claim to any of it. So, I would think that if this thing ever went to court, it would be very hard for Mr. Gendron to show that he has a claim to it. Yeah, they wrote us, from what I get from some of the information, is that there was, the legislature pa passed the law, something about paper streets. And if that's the case, I'm not so sure that it would apply here, because it's been a used way. The town has never given it up, and they've maintained it. They've put sides on it, the people have walked on it, and nobody has ever stopped us. And to give it up, to give it away, for this town, as a taxpayer, I, I'm going to be very upset about that. So I would hope that you would give us the information that we need. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, my name is Chris Edward Johnson, and I know more about this property than anyone in this room. In 1971, I was with my mother when we went traveling up and down the beach trying to find a place to relocate because my grandparents had to move from their home down in Ocean Park and we no longer had a place to spend our summers. We saw an overturned sign at 37 King Street that had been there for quite a while and I said to my mom, let's go to the real estate office and check it out. So we did. We went up 2nd Avenue to a building which my mother's brother would later buy, which was at that time a real estate offer. And my mom said, is that lot still for sale? And the fellow said, yup. And she said, how much? And he told her, I won't recite the number, it's a matter of record, but it would be rather astonishing to most people what we paid for that. Notwithstanding that, my mom said, okay. And my dad, who's a teacher, went into hock up to his eyeballs so he and my grandfather could build that modified A-frame. Now, it wasn't without trouble that we did that, and this is my reason for coming to speak. My father in 1973 submitted a request 
to the town of Scarborough to build an A-frame, which he had designed himself. And when he brought the application in, we received a letter in response, a letter dated July 7th of 1973, written from a lady named Maureen Morse, who was the then town clerk. This letter is in your files. The letter denied the application because, if I may quote, this is a corner lot and your plan does not conform to the setback requirements, which are the same setback requirements that are in effect today. And my dad said, oh my God, what can we do? And he sought counsel who said, well, you can ask for a variance that will allow you to build, but you can only build 10 yards from your lot line. I say that because at the time it was determined, it was stated, and it was concluded that the lot line of 37 King Street was the meets and bounds description contained in the deed, the same deed that I signed and gave to Mr. Gedron. And yes, there is a right of way adjacent to it, but for the purposes of building, the lot line isn't the center line of that right of way. The lot line is and has been for the last 50 years or more the meets and bounds description contained in the deed. I also have a letter received the following month that granted my dad a variance from the requirements of the town of Scarborough. Now I bring this up not to be argumentative, but to make clear that the town of Scarborough has for an excess of 50 years maintained, my dad would have said, to the detriment of the owners of the property, the fact that in order to build on that lot, you have to conform to the requirements of the town ordinances and that the house that exists on that lot today is as close as anyone can ever come to the edge of the property. You will see in a few minutes a very lovely presentation. I applaud the work of the firm that engage, was engaged by Mr. Gedron in order to create a majestic view of what that right-of-way to the beach could look like in the future. It's quite lovely. What impressed me more, and look at the picture carefully, is that Mr. Gedron, it seems to me, is proposing a beautification project for the residents of Scarborough and the general public and has no indication anywhere that he desires to build anything more than what's there because the building that's so beautifully covered by the gorgeous landscaping is in fact the building that stands there today. And if those are his objectives, then I applaud him and I will be the first person to come up here and say, go do it. I suspect, however, that this application is disingenuous. I suspect that it's what we call, well, Super Bowl's coming up in football, an end run. In 1998, the town attorney, then town attorney, Christopher, I'm, I can't make out the name because I don't have my glasses. He was with the August firm of Bernstein, Scherz, Sawyer, and Nelson, uh, a firm which is not unknown in this room. And he opined to the town in February of 1998. By the way, I didn't make copies. However, I will provide all of you with copies of these three documents. If there's a copy machine tonight, I'll do it tonight. Otherwise, you'll have them in the morning. He was addressing particularly a query that had come from the town from a gentleman who was the then assessor, Paul Esperance, 
and it particularly addresses a main law which has been bantered around in the newspapers, on letters back and forth, and having read the town attorney's very thoughtful summary, I conclude, as he concluded, it's a mess. We don't know. However, in his letter, Chris said, this is a statute, we're talking about 23 MRSA section 3033. This is a statute which describes the procedure for property owners who wish to claim ownership of any portion of a paper street which was deemed vacated on September 29, 1997. This, and I've italicized it, this is a purely private process as between private property owners, period. The town has no involvement and should not become involved. This was an opinion expressed at that time. If people wish to ask questions, feel free to direct them directly to the statute or provide them with a copy if you like, but make it clear that the town of Scarborough has no role to play in determining the status of these former, quote, paper streets, and quote, which were deemed vacated because of this provision of law. The statutory procedure, you will see, is somewhat complicated. Property owners concerned about the status of these streets should consult their own attorneys. I submit to you that any action you may take would be imprudent. The statute's very clear. And if counsel who have argued that this is the controlling statute are, are correct, then the procedure the statute lays out is the one that they should follow. That involves giving notice, making a claim, giving an opportunity for other parties to be heard, and there would be then a judicial determination. It is not within the town's power to make a determination on this issue. With that in mind, I thank you very much. Thank you. I didn't, you notice, he did not give us an address. I didn't. I don't believe he, I, Mr. Johnson. <coughs> Mr. Johnson? I'm sorry, sir, if you don't mind. Um, if, if we can get your address or um, your uh, residency. I'm formerly a resident of 37 King Street in Scarborough. Where are you now? Because of a, a fire uh, and, a, and, and a water main break, I, I had to move out, and I sure. now live at 8 Walden Avenue, Old Orchard Beach. Okay, thank you very much. Hi. <clears throat> My name's Ivor Carlson. I'm from 64 Ocean Avenue. Um, and just wanted to say a couple of words on as an advocate of uh, beach access. I've been in Scarborough for 16 years and own three properties here, two of which are beach rentals. I spend a great deal of time uh, down in that area and have accessed through that uh, right away or, or Old Town Road. Uh, when friends have rented in, in that specific area. I did do a little research, and I, my, I had two concerns as I, as I did the research, and I did le read the legal brief that uh, was prepared for the town. Um, one was when, you, when I looked at the value of the property, that the property that was recently purchased and is looking to, to uh, move to the side is assessed at one, just about $1.2 million. And if you look at the strip of the town, that's the town is looking at giving away or changing their ability to control uh, in excess of a million dollar piece of property that that strip where the right of way is when i looked at how many people probably access that specific area i did drive drive around and make sure my count was right if you start down towards the old orchard line and come up grand avenue there there are 10 access points each of those access points uh, probably serve 10 to 15 houses and probably three to four parking spots along Grand Avenue. So the impact is relatively light all the way down there. If you then skip up to Pillsbury Shore, I'm sure everyone knows those are all private, privately held access points. There's four of them that uh, have signs that they're really not a public way. It's just for the association. And then you have the parking lot. And then if you go along King Street from the piece where the uh, town did a land swap, 
uh, and I believe that was a land swap, not a giving up of any right-of-ways, but a, a switch of a piece of property, and the town still re retained ownership of that property. Um, you can go on that, which is the corner of King and Pine. You can go up Avenue 1, Avenue 2, not Avenue 3, because that now is where the condos are. Uh, Avenue 4, I believe, is still available, and then the parking lot. Now, Avenue 4 is near another home that is on a 50-foot lot, which I assume would jump on board if they knew they could get into the, into the street. Um, this particular house, uh, having owned other properties of Beach, I did look at this house twice when it was for sale. It was incredibly clear. It was a 50-foot wide lot um, and 100 and some odd feet long, and you could probably ex build a nice little uh, updated cottage on that little existing footprint. If you look at that, Avenue 2, and you look at uh, conservatively look at how many houses access that, uh, and those are the most part the people that use that. There's just about 40 homes. That's a far cry from Grand Avenue, where every 10 homes have an access point. So it's it's a it's a major point. I would encourage the town not to make a change there without going to court. I, I feel that's what the court is. I pay taxes in town. I would love to see it fought in court. I did read that brief and I believe that the town has just as much right to the property as what the landowner is proposing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Is there anybody else? And, and before the next speaker, um, so as chair, there's some discretion. Um, so there are a lot of questions that are going to be raised during the workshop. So I believe that in order to facilitate that workshop, we will need to cut off uh, public comments after possibly after Ms. Foley Ferguson. There will be other opportunities uh, for public conversation on this. I want you to know that this is not the end of that conversation. So go ahead, ma'am. Actually, the fact that you just said that, um, I was a little nervous that you might have this workshop and then at the next thing would be you would go into executive session and the public and then make sort of a decision amongst yourselves and, and then come forward and make that decision. Um, I'm glad to hear that you would say that because I know that in executive session you're probably privy to more than we are. There's just a few comments I, w I would make about about this issue. Um, if you should decide to, to take it to court and um, without being privy to what you guys might be privy to and I'm not, I would say that you should definitely fight for your rights because um, it could set precedence for other pres prescriptive access points. So there's, it, after reading this, it appears that there's a, a number of different ways that you could argue that the town does have rights. And the one is the public pr prescriptive easement. And I realize that they've taken that away. They use Goose Rocks, Goose Rocks and Cedar Beach as examples of um, emerging law cases that should not, sh that are of uh, concern. But Cedar Beach, the woman actually paid for the road. And Goose Rocks, it was an easement across the beach. And Goose Rocks is way, way different. This is a subdivision. So that's one thing. I'm really kind of surprised that a lot of the arguments that our attorney might use are, are laid out here in these letters. In fact, I was really actually shocked to, to read it because I thought that's something you guys should have kept in your little pocket in the executive session. But what I'll read is what, what one of the arguments is. In order for the property owner to assert ownership to the center line of Avenue 2 under MRSA 33465, he must affirmatively show that the original conveyance from Scanlon and Carter to Mrs. Libby was not accomplished in reference to a recorded plan. And every single deed within the property owner's change of title does refer to that plan. Okay, so there's another different kind of an argument. So you have the prescriptive. As far as the prescriptive easements, um, he just talked about 40 homes using it constantly. We had women uh, just talked about using other residents from Scarborough. And then also the renters at all within uh, Pine Point have used it for it. So it's a very different situation than Goose Rocks and Cedar Beach. So I, I don't envy your um, discussion, but I you know, I'm not sure what's going to happen in this workshop, but I'd also be very careful to hold your cards tight, tighter, and not give away what your arguments are going to be if you want to fight in court. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> 
Keep in mind, Ms. Hamill, that you're sitting at the table and we'll have an opportunity to discuss your comments there. I did. Um, I'm Susan Hamill. I live on Bay Street, uh, number three Bay Street. Um, I did send a, uh, a letter to the council, and I, I just want to read a very short part of, of that letter. I know the legal arguments are all over the place on this, and but and I know that taking legal action can be an expensive process, especially for individuals acting alone or even as a small group. But we believe that this is the true role of government to step in and assist citizens to perform some action which would be difficult for each citizen to do individually. Building a seawall at Higgins, Higgins Beach is a good example of an action undertaken by the town on behalf of its taxing citizens. Plowing roads, dredging the channel, likewise could be considered the same way. So maintaining public access to the beach through public ownership and defending this right of way should be viewed the same, very same way. Thanks. Thank you. And with that, we're going to close the public uh, comments section of uh, today's uh, <coughs> workshop. And um, I'm going to ask the council and those that we have invited to uh, come to the table, and then we'll begin the workshop. I'm going to move uh, quickly and immediately into the workshop session. Um, and before I turn it over to uh, staff and council and then uh, over to the council uh, as well as our guests uh, for questions and answers, just to put some framework around this. Uh, so this is a time for us to be able to ask questions and find out facts um, that support the, um, and when I say support, it supports the discussion on the issue of Avenue 2, not necessarily supporting any action because nothing has um, been affirmative uh, uh, presented to us by council or by staff. So this is a fact-finding session. It's not an opinion-based uh, session. Um, the goal is that uh, everyone will be treated fairly um, around their questions and kind of, um, I try to work the workshops, um, you know, be polite to each other, uh, wait until someone is completed and try to uh, ask a question. I'm not going to require everyone to raise their hand, but I'll try to give some ordinance to it because we always have 55 minutes. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Tom. F um, oh, I'm sorry. For the record, because we are being taped, or I think we might even be live, is if we can go uh, um, around the table and introduce ourselves and um, what body, entity, or um, who we're representing um, as far as uh, our group that we're with. So we start with Council Foley. Uh, Katie Foley, Government Town Council. Uh, Will Rowland, Government Town Council. Bill Donovan, Town Council. <coughs> Gerald Parkinson, Bergen and Parkinson for the town. Ben McCall, Bergen and Parkinson, also for the town. Tom Hall, town manager. Great. Sue Hamill, Pine Point resident. Phil Reed, Pine Point resident. Peter Hayes, Skyward Town Council. Chris Chiazzo, town council. Sean Bay, I'm chair of the council. Um, Pete St. Clair. Thank you. Vice chair. And Mr. Chair, I just point out, uh, <laughs> Attorney Lankowski, on behalf of the Gables, the Condominium yes. Association, is here tonight. Uh, in recent weeks, uh, kind of late in the conversation, they've expressed some interest in being a part of these conversations. So if it pleases the council, we can invite him to be part of this. So you can appreciate uh, their perspective. Well, the party to this, absolutely. Could you give the name again? I'm sorry, Tom. Joe Blankowski. Yeah. Yeah. I'll let him introduce himself. <laughs> <laughs> Just introduce yourself. Uh, Joseph Blankowski. I represent Gables on the Sea. The to the, uh, Avenue Are you a resident there, sir? No, I'm your attorney. Thank you. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom for any quick um, overview, and then I believe we're going to receive a um, sure. 
Chair, comments this, from the Council. I think this evening is a long time in coming. It's been months in kind of the works. We've promised this opportunity to the Pine Point uh, Residents Association to have an opportunity to sit with the Council, to exchange ideas, and to do it in a workshop format so it's really intended to be an exchange of, of facts and, and uh, information. Uh, we have invited our town attorney here this evening and make him uh, and his associate available to the council and to the residents uh, alike. It is somewhat unprecedented that we have we make him available in this capacity, but we think it's important for people to understand as much as we can about um, the legal issues surrounding um, uh, this whole matter. Um, with that, I've asked Durwood to be prepared to provide a quick synopsis. I, I think many in the room have probably read his legal opinion. But I think you can probably present it uh, fairly succinctly just to maybe kick this off, if that's, if that's okay. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the public, members of the board, thank you for having me up here. Uh, as Tom said, I'm Durward Parkinson. I'm a, an attorney at the law firm Bergen and Parkinson in Kennebunk. And the reason I emphasize Kennebunk is we're not the normal uh, town attorney. We were brought into this matter because of some conflict of interest issues. Um, so. Um, I believe we can say probably with a straight face we're independent. We uh, uh, don't live in town, see folks at the grocery store. And we're just uh, coming up here and attempting to um, call things as we see them um, based on the facts that are presented. Uh, we do have a lot of experience in this type of case. Uh, of course, your community is much like the communities that we serve in York County, York and Wells and Kittery, and, and they've had similar cases, and I've had a lot of experience in over 30 years of practice uh, with these types of issues. Um, we're the regular attorney for the town of Wells, for example, and I was uh, the attorney that uh, we were fortunate enough to be successful in uh, winning the case where we proved a public prescriptive easement in Wells Beach, and that's a pretty important law in the state of Maine. So it's an area of the law that we know pretty well. Um, but um, the more you know it, the more complicated you realize it is, and every time I um, get a chance to get involved with paper streets, dedicated roads, abandonment, beach rights, and that sort of thing. I always have to take a deep breath and start from the beginning and realize that every, every case is different. Um, it's a very complex area of the law. I think I made the joke before that no lawyer ever uh, goes to law school and says, I want to be an abandoned law, uh, road lawyer, uh, <laughs> a paper street lawyer. Uh, it is a part of municipal law, but it's a very uh, complicated and arcane and hasn't been updated like other areas of the law. So there's a lot of room for confusion. I don't claim to have the last word in this, uh, and certainly facts can change, and sometimes you don't uh, always have all the facts uh, when uh, right at hand in the beginning. So let me talk about what we did. Uh, we received the extensive uh, a letter from Attorney John Bannon, who uh, is a well-respected lawyer in Portland in, in municipal and land use law. Uh, we were asked to uh, attempt to respond to this, to do a deep dive, not a, a superficial uh, response a letter, but really you know, take a hard look at what the, the points were, were which were made in that letter, and, and uh, I believe that we did do that. Um, did we do everything that was, could be possibly done uh, to review the matter? Uh, the answer is definitely not. Let me just talk about a few of those things. One is uh, we rely on the um, the staff to provide us with the uh, town records. In other words, we don't, it's not normally our process to get into the town hall and start pulling up the file cabinets and looking at documents. I'm not saying it's never happened, but you know, the town has an excellent staff and I think it's uh, very reasonable to rely on their uh, research of the records to determine what does and doesn't exist. The, and the second thing we didn't do is we didn't uh, put someone in the registry of deeds, uh, and I think frankly well, this would have taken many days or perhaps many weeks uh, to um, pull every deed and run uh, title on uh, all of the chains of title um, in, in that area that might have been relevant. And I just want to say that we didn't do that. We did, of course, look uh, at the deeds uh, that were in particular were referenced and see if they fit together in a general sense, but we didn't do a total uh, title search on that. We, we do, I believe, make that clear in our letter. That could be done. Uh, it would be time consuming, it would be somewhat expensive. I think I could get back to the town about that, about the course that they wanted to, uh, you wanted to go with, but it's, uh, it's, it's definitely uh, upping the ante quite a bit in terms of the expense. So um, 
As you can see from our letter, we tried to keep it as readable as possible, but it's, it's you know, something if you have a problem sleeping, it might be a, you know, a, a, an aid for that. I mean, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, as you know, it, it gets down to five or six key issues. Is, um, do the gendrons have title to the um, western half of Avenue 2? And we discuss that, and the answer to it is, is, is unfortunately unclear whether they have title. And it, a lot depends on which plan you accept. If it's the 1875 plan or the Moulton plan, uh, and we discuss that in detail. So the answer is unclear uh, based on what we know. Was it dedicated uh, to the town? Uh, we think it probably was. So the, the, the Avenue 2 was probably dedicated to the town. Uh, next important issue. And the, the next one after that is whether it was accepted uh, by the town. We put an unclear on that, and that's uh, all discussed whether you're accepting it. The Pillsbury plan is the same as the Moulton plan, and, and that takes uh, a lot of analysis, and, and it may not ever lead to a definite answer. Um, can the town win the case in any event uh, for a prescriptive easement? Um, i got to think that the town has a lot of uh, points in its favor in this, in terms of uh, equity, that this has uh, been a, a, a property that's been used consistently over the years for public access. Um, but if you square up uh, some of the comments and elements that the courts are now requiring or emphasizing in these cases involving prescriptive easement, there are some challenges there. Uh, but um, my understanding is that the um, property owner is not attempting to deny public access, it's attempting to achieve it through a different, uh, a different mechanism, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, a lot's been talked about about private rights. You know, where, where are the private rights in this? And uh, there's, a, again, room for uh, reasonable minds to, to differ. Our conclusion doesn't have anything to do with the status of private rights. To the extent that folks have private rights either through their own deeds or through other theories, um, that, for example, that it's because it's on an old plan, maybe they have some implied rights to pass. Uh, there's nothing that I'm talking about that would in any way extinguish private rights. And the folks that have those private rights certainly have the right to vindicate those or prove those out in court um, and, and, and protect their private rights. We have had a recent uh, experience where I was similar to here, uh, Council in Cape Elizabeth on their green belt uh, plan where they were accepting a number of paper streets. And, and whether there were still private rights in the paper streets, and, and, and there were, and the, and the folks needed to, and they did get uh, their own legal counsel to, to advise them on their private rights. So private rights may exist here, uh, they may not, um, but they need to be addressed by the folks that, ha that, that have them. So um, we're not here to tell anybody what to do, just here to give uh, advice based on what we know. Uh, certainly there's um, a good reason to consider an outcome that guarantees public access, and we've discussed that, and, and uh, the, there is a concept that is being floated around that the, an outcome would be that the town would discontinue uh, this road. That would be a way of, 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 of assuming that the town is right, that it actually is the owner of the road, and it is a public road, it would be discontinued. But simultaneously with that, the town would take back an, an easement, a permanent easement that could not be ever um, voided or taken out of existence, uh, allowing public access. An easement with terms to it that talk about um, width and use and uh, landscaping and other appropriate uh, terms and conditions. And that's uh, the concept that we've been talking about. Um, I'm here to answer questions. I've, I've seen several emails about uh, with questions. If anybody has any questions, but you know, it, 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 in the end, it's your town to decide what's best. I'm not here telling you how, how to do it. Hopefully, just give you some good advice. Thank you. <coughs> if you're, if everyone's okay, I'd, I'd rather open this up to questions directly to council. If anyone has any, one thing might be helpful. Start. Joe, I don't want to put you on the spot, but it might be helpful just to kind of, uh, for everyone's benefit, to understand what the condo association's yeah. position yeah. is on the matter that yeah. might help inform the conversation. Um, I, I think that uh, the condo association kind of kind of came into this, you know, after, a little bit after the fact. Um, we we are on the other side of the road, obviously. So if the if the road is <laughs> as we go through the steps, as as Drew would did, if you 
for sake of argument, assume that there was a dedication and acceptance of something back in whenever that was, so that the so that the town has some interest. Whether uh, you know, it, it, the other question is, what is that interest? Is it an ownership interest? Is it an easement? Uh, since 19. 50. 50. Well, no, I mean, it, when the statute went into effect, it said when there's a dedication and an acceptance now, it's clear that the town owns the fee to the road. Back when this happened, it was probably an easement as opposed to actual ownership, uh, unless that matters. Um, so we're on the other side. If the town owned the road and discontinues that ownership, then the road, then ownership of the road reverts to the abutter. So that's why we're here. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, could you ask the gentleman to speak up? Please Mr. Can you pull that microphone closer to him? I'm not sure if that helps with the audience. No, I know, but I know if they can't hear, then no one at home can hear either. <laughs> <laughs> so for however many years, everybody just sort of lived with the ambiguity out there of who owns it, what is it, what rights do it, does anybody have in it, and my clients we're not tremendously concerned about that ambiguity. Um, now we have a situation that's in front of the council where <coughs> someone is trying to resolve that ambiguity because of, of, of their needs and how they want to use their property. And my clients have absolutely no problem with what Mr. General would like to do out there, so in, in no way opposed to that. Our problem is that um, Whatever's done, we just would like to see it done with the entirety of the road, and that's really our primary issue. Um, there was we got I got drawn into it by my client because they were concerned. What does it mean if the council decides to discontinue half of the road? I said I have no idea, but if you but if it's a mess now, I don't think that's going to make it less of one. Um, you know. Some of us here are lawyers, so we worry about lawyer stuff that normal people don't worry about uh, and shouldn't. But my concern was, as I said, everybody's lived with the ambiguity out there for however many years, and we've never had a resolution. What does the town have? Do they have ownership? Whatever. Ironically, if the town discontinues half the road, then at the same time that they've done that, they've essentially claimed ownership of the other half. So now my clients are suddenly in a position where the ambiguity has become more ambiguous and potentially to their detriment because now there's a document out there that suggests that the town is claiming to own their half of the road. So we're kind of here just to say we think it's, we're, we're fine if, if the town wishes to discontinue the road so that this project can go forward, especially in view of the fact that, uh, as I understand it, the, the a permanent recorded easement for public use goes along with it. We just don't want to see a situation where uh, we're sort of left over here in limbo somewhere. So we're just kind of saying, whatever you're going to do, do it to the please do it to the whole thing. <laughs> um, can I just ask him one question? Okay. Sure. Um, I I'll be honest. I wasn't prepared for you to be here, so I don't have the email in front of me. I believe I brought this up when we met with our attorneys um, or I've spoken to maybe someone else about it, but um, when this whole thing started, I received an email from two of the people at the condo who said, we don't want anything to do with this. We don't even want to, we don't want our names brought into it. We don't want no nothing to do with this. So I guess my question to you is, um, are you representing the <coughs> consensus? Are you representing everyone? Are you representing one person? Um, does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. It's a good question. Um, I've dealt with Nick Scascia, who is the, the chairman of the of the board, so to speak. So his last name is Gasha. Scascia. Scascia. C A C C I A. Gotcha. So I have not. I did not meet with the board on Moss. I just have been following, getting my direction from from yeah. Nick Scascia, and he indicated to me that he met with the board. The board decided that this is how they wanted okay. to, to deal with it. Okay. That's good enough for me. Okay. I just wanted to I wanted to make sure just because it's rare to get um, emails like that and then have a shift like 
a shift and for there to have all of a sudden there be a, an attorney representing these people. So I wanted to make sure that the council was clear on that that was a change because I had made it known that I had received these emails and that at that time the condo association wanted nothing to do with it. So I want to make sure that we're covering our basis. So thank you for answering that. Questions for council? Yes. So, Mr. Lankowski, am I to understand that your client is willing to enter into a similar or identical negotiation that we are with Mr. Jenner in terms of uh, easements, or do you want to be a party to that, or is it a separate discussion? What's the will, what's your intention? Well, my understanding of um, where the discussions have gone at this point, uh, my client, uh, and I, I think I spoke to Durward about this, the, the, as I understand it, the walking path that is physically present on the ground uh, is apparently uh, entirely on the um, gender side of the side of the line. So uh, our assumption is that that, and, and I think the agreement that's in the works is that's where it would is that's where it would stay. Um, I had indicated that if, if it was helpful, because I, I think what my client would do would like to do if the discontinuance occurred is they would like to, you know, have something out there that shows where the limits of their property are. Because they're not going to, they can't do any more building. There's no, this isn't going to do anything for them in terms of increasing sizes of it. Everything that's there is there. So um, what I had said to, to Durwood uh, is if, if it would be helpful for example, to to have say another you know five feet on the line so that people aren't worried that they're you know going too far this way. That anything that, that my clients would agree that anything they put up by way of a fence or whatever it is, they could you know for example locate it five feet off the line instead of on the line, so that to the extent that that path you know meanders, that we can be sure that nobody's going to have a problem with that. Okay. Would that be in terms in the form of an easement, or would that be a separate negotiation? Well, I, I guess I'd have to say now it would be in the form of a separate negotiation because I don't have specific authority to do, to sit at the table and say I can do that. But I but I can tell you that they would. It is something. Yes, we would be willing to talk to and become a part of the conversation with. Mr. Reed? Did, did I just hear you say that you, you thought that the path would stay where it is presently? No, I, my understanding, yeah, that wasn't very clear, was it? My understanding is that where it is now right. is on the Correct. gender side. My, my understanding also was that it was going to be moved but stay on the gender side. That, that some, I don't know how, I've not, I have not seen a plan, so I don't know what the exact idea is. That's simply my understanding of what was being discussed, that it was still going to be on the gender half, but, but <coughs> that some of it might be in a different location from where it is currently. That's about all I know. I just don't think that's my understanding of it. I could be wrong also. I, well, I thought I it was going to be moved completely over. No, there have been no discussions that I'm aware of uh, to that effect. Didn't well, they come up with a proposed plan? And as was described, those plans have that path essentially existing where it does today, with a few exceptions, but in all cases existing on the half width that would, gender's half width, if you will. Ms. Hamilton, was your hammer? You know? So are we talking about um, a an easement that would be 50 feet wide, the, the width of the existing um, roadway, or are we talking that it would that it would be 10 feet, or what, are, what kind of easement are we talking about? Well, everything's up for discussion, um, but the, some of the discussions have been about having an easement over the entirety of the area, but an understanding that the traveled um, support that would be for a path would be delineated uh, towards, if it makes any sense, the <coughs> easterly half of the westerly side, um, and, it, and it's all been drawn out on a, on a plan. So that if Mr. Jenrin wanted to get a, uh, a building permit, that um, so that his side setback would would his side setback be able to make use of the 25 feet? Yes. So could he actually build on part of what is currently? I don't think so. No, I think yeah. the attorney would tell me in a few seconds. Absolutely not. 
we could assure that through uh, yeah. the uh, the easement language to assure that no way that the building is going to be into the what is currently the but it, but that land could be counted theoretically for setback purposes to answer the first part of your question. Okay. Uh, Councilor Foley, did you have something? I think I saw your hand up. I have a few questions and a couple of comments. So, um, so. But I know I'm watching. I'm watching the. Yeah, I just want to. I, 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 you know, sometimes the worst part of this job is actually trying to keep everyone on time. So we have, like, because at the end there's um, kind of just council discussion. So we have 30 minutes. So uh, if we can kind of stick to the fact finding part of this, it would be great. Okay. Well, just to the no, actually, thank, thank you, ma'am. Um. Hmm. All right. I'm gonna uh, skip one. I'm gonna go right to this one. Uh, whereas the Goose Rocks case and Cedar Beach cases were both cited in mm -hmm. your work, yes. um, were both of those situations where the public walked to the beach on those paths, or was it the path in front of the beach? Well, the Goose Rocks Beach um, is, is a case about walking on the beach itself, uh, and I think the Cedar Beach case is about uh, access <coughs> to it and, and maybe the beach it, it, itself. Okay. In, in Goose Rocks, there are dedicated public access ways to it? Yep. That's an important question. And Nope, that was great. I'm just trying to get to a real clear, quick point. Um, and is it true in the private, in the Cedar Beach case that the owner actually purchased that road? I think that may be true, but I'd have to... Okay. You know. okay. Um, and then, I guess this would be an issue for, or a question for Tom, but I know it's been raised. I don't know if we've had a conversation with our assessor, but what is the determined value of that the stretch of land that we're talking about. I've had some initial conversations. There's a difference between uh, value for assessment purposes and what an appraiser might value it at, mm -hmm. fair market value, yep. if you will. And I'm not prepared to answer anything relative to its fair market value. Uh, undoubtedly, there, there is value associated with it. Um, I'm not having to do extensive work, but there would be more value to Mr. Gendron than there would be to the Condo Association, given uh, how it complements his uh, not just complements, but enables him to do additional development on his property. Um, but I'm not in a position to, to advise you what that number is. Okay. But there certainly is value associated. Okay. <coughs> no? oh. So I have a question for the Pine Point residents joining us tonight. What exactly are you asking for, for us to do? Because I've heard a couple of different questions and concerns even tonight about what the outcome needs to be. So as representatives of your group, what exactly would you like this outcome to look like? We'd like to everything to stay exactly the way it is. That's the very best case. Are there any alternatives to that? You mean second best? Yes. <laughs> yeah, compromise, basically. Well, we, we were thinking that, you know, uh, you know, since Mr. Jedrin has a, a purpose in mind for this, uh, you know, is there a possibility of giving him some sort of variance in terms of the setbacks that would mitigate uh, his using the established easement? Can I follow? Yeah. So I guess my, 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 my real question is, is your primary concern as a group, if I understand it correctly, is maintaining public access to that beach. Is that correct? Is that fair? No, it's maintaining public access as it is. It, it's, uh, it's, as you can see from their diagram, they want to put a straight path in. Uh, I think most of the people I have talked to uh, look at that as a historic path that uh, has character and uh, it, it, I feel it's on uh, an easement. They have either a public easement or a private easement and they want it to remain the same. So you want that path to stay, I just want to clarify, yes. I want to make sure I'm 100% clear. Yeah. You want that path to stay exactly the way it is and you are not comfortable compromising the position of that path in any way, shape or form? Correct. Right. If, if you walk that path, it is like stepping into um, Pine Point as it was 100 years ago. <coughs> it, is, it's, it seems pristine. I know that there's gravel down, um, but it is, um, especially as you're walking in uh, right off of, of um, King Street, it's, uh, you know, there's nothing like it. it there's the, you're, you're in a, a mini forest. It's like a little environment. I mean, there are scruff pines there, and it winds around. And um, having grown up, I grew up on 9th Street, and we had woods across the street that aren't there now. And it was the same, you know, you had that same feeling that it's, it's sandy soil and there's trees all around. And it's, it's just, 
and people who I have talked to who walk, because I don't live in that area, but people who do live in that area and use that path um, have said <coughs> that it's, you know, it's been this way since they were kids. So. Okay. Um, there was a suggestion that uh, the town should uh, put a park in there with picnic tables and access points. I believe that came from your organization as well. Is that no longer on the table then? I have no knowledge about that. Well, that was. I know there's a bench there now. You know, that, put a bench on it. That wasn't my question. There was a there was a question of we should take that that property <coughs> and develop it and make it into a, a park with picnic tables and more access and more open access. If I understand it correctly. If the path gets moved, then um, then I think if if the path gets moved and we start planning, you know, rhododendrons or whatever, then let's let's definitely put picnic tables and you know make it handicap ADA and everything. Let's just do it. But if, if but that is not our first choice. The first choice is to leave everything as it is. Thank you. Can I have a question? Um, this is a, hopefully just a minor point, but I picked up on one thing you said. You mentioned that the condo association was potentially talking about a fence. Is that something that they're looking at? If this goes in that direction, are they going to put a fence up? I can't tell you if they're going to. I mean, I, I, I think it's a possibility. I think that they would want to, because uh, I believe there's a, f I, ha I have not been out there. I think there's a f like a, some small fence or something on the it's line it's now. Small, but it's not. Uh, so whatever it is that they sort of have on the line now, they would probably want to move to the new line that was established if this, if this discontinuance happens. Because to me, there's a big difference between you know, a small wire fence and a 10 foot high. Oh no, uh, no, there's no suggestion that they want, mm -hmm. they try to screen themselves off from anything. It's just. Do you know what I'm saying? No, like that's, oh, that's a huge difference to me, no, in my opinion. It'd be the same, as I said, the same thing that I think is out there now. It's just, you know, a small fence that sort of said, this is where our property okay. starts. That's, all right. That's all it's, they're talking about. it's just to me that's taking away more access. Mm -hmm. Well, this question goes goes with the the easement, but it, it's of great concern, is the, to me at least, is the fact that uh, Mr. Genron uh, uh, apparently, I presume, is going to want to use that back beach land that he's claiming he owns by adverse possession. What what can the town do to head that off, if anything? He's got it in his deed, that, uh, in his predecessor's deed into him, that uh, he's claiming that hold back piece by adverse possession. I, I, we're not in a position to answer that question. I, I, we've not done the research to know. To well, I just wanted opinion. to put a heads up out there you have. that this is pending. That will be incumbent on him to do that research and to provide the... I just you know, wanted to make sure that there isn't some action that the uh, the town needs to take. Uh, is, is it fair to say, uh, Tom, and to legal our legal counsel, is that um, when presented with possibilities that are in somewhat hypothetical, there are issues to be taken up as part of any negotiation regarding the issue and not something that can necessarily be answered in advance. So the question regarding what it could generally do versus what can the town council do when that happens is hypothetical in my nature, but it's a good list, as an item to add to the list so that we think about it as part of the negotiation. Yeah, the way we've approached this is we have been talking about, in general terms, <coughs> what we would allow and permit to happen within that 50 feet. Right. Mm -hmm. What happens outside of it is subject to his wishes, whether it complies with other regulations, there's sensitive dune areas that need to be respected. There's, all, there's a myriad of things that will dictate what can and can't happen. So for purposes of this conversation, we've really focused on what can happen within these 50 feet. And I think we have some, we can speak of that in, in a fair degree of certainty. What happens on the other part is subject to his wishes and whether it complies. Other questions? Well, and you're looking for feedback from us, correct? Um, at the end, so the at, the end. at the end, yeah. Oh. Could I just ask one more question about the association? So, hypothetically, uh, if the easement were to the full 50 feet, but Mr. Gendron were allowed to build from the center line, meaning that he could use that 25 feet as his setback, would that be an agreement that your association would be amenable to? 
Well, I mean, I, I'm, I can't speak for the whole association, but for me it would be. Uh, you know, if, that, if that's what it came down to. Just as long as that path doesn't change. Right. And we basically don't want to see a, a, an easement, a 50-foot easement that the, the people in Pine Point feel belongs to them be taken away from them. Okay. Would it be helpful for all involved, for, uh, for Durwood or myself, to describe the basic deal points that we've just had in discussion? So you appreciate that. That'd what, be great. I've been I, well, hold on for, sorry. <coughs> are they finalized or what stage are we at in the Not at all. We don't have any other discussion. <coughs> but we, for purposes of this has been going on for better than a year, and we've had a number of discussions as to how might this look. Um, but we've not agreed to anything. So we can describe what we've talked about, if that's at yeah. all helpful to you. And the purpose of the uh, council t uh, conversation at the end for consensus is that we have not given any direction about what we wish to do, whether it is to uh, pursue our legal uh, any legal rights to uh, just claim that we own it versus it negotiating it. So nothing has been given as a final. Staff does that for the purposes of preparing us what our options are. So I want that, that to be clear that there has been no negotiation by this council or decisions by this council at all. The question I have before we get into the details is, um, given the interest of the Pine Point Association, and I think we can all agree, um, that not every Pine Point resident belongs to your association, and we've also received communications that totally disagree with your mm -hmm. group's position. How do we balance that based upon your guidelines or your limitations of what you think should and shouldn't be done? Well, of course, I mean, you, you have to use your best judgment, obviously. Okay. And I'm, sh I'm sure you will. But keep, yeah, and keeping in mind that here we are in, in it's February, um, we have there's a large group of people who are not here right now, and um, the the number of people who are in attendance uh, well, is you know. Five people at the last meeting. Okay. Okay. They have to yeah. Ma'am, this, yeah. this is actually yeah, this conversation uh, and not to be implied. I apologize. There will be more time. Yeah. We we had a large group in October, and I'm sure. I mean, we've we've had no meetings at all during the summer. So um, to talk about this with the council, I mean, there's been no workshop, nothing at the you know prime time. Um, it and I understand the reasons for it. So thank you. I'm not opposed to hearing the presentation. I, I, yeah. I think you're yeah, going to show yeah. what I actually Definitely. saw. Is it the same the things that we saw down at the firehouse? I'm assuming. Uh, so, yeah, right. so, for new but people I, but that I are do want to make sure that we are going to have time at the end because I did sure. cut my comments short oh, I know. to help. <laughs> Thank you. One thing this council doesn't have a problem with is commenting. <laughs> I, mean, I do have video simula simulations available, uh, but I think we can probably speak to the basic field points, and that yes. might be helpful. So, Dirty, could you just so, so just from a legal point of view, uh, it would be a discontinuance of the, the road uh, of uh, Avenue 2, of 50 feet, and that would. Yeah, include the, the condo side. Uh, simultaneously, uh, the town taking back a perpetual easement for um, pedestrian uh, foot traffic, uh, and also emergency uh, EMT, you know, ATV type of uh, equipment we need to get down there, but not larger vehicles than that. Emergency type vehicles. Um, the width uh, would have to, has been discussed uh, in, in general, but no decisions, have, of course, have been made on anything or on that. Um, there would be some landscaping plans that would be approved. Uh, there would be some provisions about if there was a violation of any of the <coughs> understandings that there would be consequences like payment of attorney's fees, for example, uh, to the prevailing party. Uh, those were some of the, the key points. Um, the some feedback I was getting is that you know, we could have an agreement, but the agreement is only as good as the paperwork that's uh, behind it. How how tough could it be? We would you know try as hard as we could to make as uh, many um, strong provisions in, in favor of the town. You know, obviously it's a two-way street. Um, we have enjoyed uh, um, collaborative uh, discussions with the attorney for the other side, and and certainly with the condominium association. Um, so those were kind of the, the, I guess the final point would be no structures uh, right. allowed either. Just no structures. Um, but there is room for discussion. We were always very clear that we didn't have authority. We weren't deal dealing. We were just discussing. And, and with that, the, what we entered that conversation with was the two essential things that we thought were, were essential, which are maintaining public access first and foremost, mm -hmm. and essentially having it look as close to what it is today. Uh, 
um, you know, nothing new in that. Uh, um, Bill and Peter, you're the only two that haven't asked any questions. Is there anything specific that you would like to ask? <coughs> It's evident that uh, with the condominium association's uh, new interest that uh, the question arises, <clears throat> if we can't reach an agreement with both parties, does that cause the whole thing to fall of its own weight? Um, <coughs> technically not, um, but I have struggled with the issue uh, if we go this discontinuance route that uh, is it a little bit odd or maybe overly creative to think that you're discontinuing half of a road down the middle? All the statute says you can discontinue a road in whole or in part. I'm not sure the legislators that drafted that were thinking about discontinuing <laughs> down the middle. Uh, <coughs> the I'm not sure I would have to argue that from front of the judge. So you know, maybe, maybe not, but um, I think hopefully you understand where it might just You know, any other questions from counselors or from the uh, well, um, reader? So, so just to reiterate, uh, if, the, if, the, if, for instance, the town did discontinue the road and, and, and uh, make the agreements, uh, all the and, and it changed the location of the right of way or, or diminished it in some way, the private owners would still have a right. To, uh, would still have to be notified by Mr. Jenrin, wouldn't they? And uh, <coughs> given an opportunity to uh, object, file suit, and that sort of thing? Well, private owners have whatever rights the private owners have, and, and, and that could include, I suppose, appealing the, the discontinuance order, if, if that was... Uh, I'm thinking in terms of a private And agent. in terms of any private rights you felt you had, you, you could attempt to enforce those through the civil process in the, in the courts. It's a civil remedy. Um, I, I, I do have a question. Yeah. So, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just catching up on that now. So, so there's private right-of-ways across the, what is now the public road? Uh, I, uh, our attorney should be uh, probably talking about that, but basically, according to the law, there's two sets of rights in that right of way. One private, uh, implied, uh, implicit private rights from all the people who are members of the subdivision to get to the beach via that right of way. And then there's the presumption, correct me if I'm wrong, that there's a, pub a public easement, and that's what we're talking about now which the town may have some interest in. Mr. Johnson, I would disagree with you on uh, or you or somebody else that was talking about some cases about paper streets um, and that, that and there was a lot of discussion about a separate process that happens with paper streets. The way we're looking at this is that these are actually paper streets. A paper street is a street that was dedicated by a developer but never accepted. It's called incipient dedication. Uh, the town's position, you know, even though it may be slightly um, vulnerable, uh, is that it was not only dedicated but accepted, so it actually is a street. And so that process okay. that was being discussed where the private po folks have 180 <laughs> days to bring a case, I would say it doesn't apply. But, you know, your attorney could tell you something right. else, but sure. that's what, what so I would say. If that's true, then why are we even talking about this? Why, why, I mean, why is this even an issue? If, if you're, what you're saying is that it does appear that it was not only dedicated but accepted, and it is a street that. Well, the letter the letter talks about the the, the issues that surround that. I think I would just ask you to know that it, it's it's not as straightforward as we'd like it to be. It's you know, as I went in my summary, that some points are more clear than others, and dedication and acceptance aren't that clear. Council Paul, I'm just. You said you wanted questions first and then move on to comment. I'm just being mindful of time. Sure. You're now down to 15 minutes. I, the, the last question I have, I guess, maybe before we get into that last 15 minutes is, um, given the most recent comments about that, my understanding is that our negotiating point forward is we own that street, but we are negotiating to discontinue it. So therefore, right. it, it mutes the, the conversation about private. We don't need to argue it because we're saying we own it. Yes. Right? Yes. Well, there's no debate about that. At least I don't think there is. Well, I mean, there's well uh, except for the applicant, debate, of course. But, yes. uh, <laughs> our position is the town yeah. owns that we're considering okay. discontinuing it in return for getting something that clears up any doubt about the public's right to use it. Okay. Something that's ironclad. 
So uh, keep, keeping in mind that we're going to have other public sessions in which you can speak, sir, that just rose your hand. Um, I'd like to move this now into, because we do have 15 minutes, uh, move it into uh, council member comments, because um, uh, we do need to uh, discuss how uh, we would like to move this forward, if we do or not, or what, what is our next step in this process. Um, so uh, with that, um, I'm going to open it. So I am going to limit the comments, uh, questions, or comments to town council members only for this purpose. Uh, so I'd like to hear what your positions are so I can maybe try to summarize a consensus point for staff to move forward. So, Councilor Foley? Sure. So, first thing I just want to be clear and you clarified it, but I'm saying it again because I heard it used by a few different people that we were in a negotiation or that there was an agreement in the works and from my perspective that has not been the case at all. We've been sharing information and gathering information, but I want it very clear to the public and particularly the Pine Point Association that we have entered no agreement or negotiation with Mr. Gendron. Um, my second uh, couple comments, um, I, I think the law can indeed be murky, um, but I don't believe the use of this path is murky at all. And uh, I believe it's been used by the public for a very long time, um, and that's clear. So if we're saying that we would have to go through this continuance, so we're saying we own, this, own that property, and there's no way that I personally would support discontinuing access to the beach. Um, beach access is one of the things I ran my campaign on, and um, I believe in it deeply, and I would never, and, you know, I know we may lose if we went to court, but um, I would fight for that. And then lastly, um, <coughs> I have a hard time, and I've, I've gone through the paperwork, um, believing that, and I've, I've heard from folks that Mr. Jennings is a lovely man, I've never had an opportunity to meet him myself. I have offered, I had folks put my number out to him and said, have him give me a call if he wants to talk, and I'd still welcome the coffee in that conversation. I uh, wish they could come up with a solution themselves, but um, I have a hard time believing that he didn't know very clearly and understand uh, in purchasing this property that this was in fact a public path. So that's kind of where I stand on it and um, I don't think I've surprised anybody. <laughs> Thank you. So I guess I would take a uh, slightly different approach. Um, I, I think that um, from a principal standpoint that makes a lot of sense, um, but um, if, our position, I think, is not clear, and I think that there's a lot of risk if we take the position of we're willing to give up the uh, the access to the beach by going to court. I think that potentially there's um, that we need just to get clarity. If we can get clarity while maintaining the uh, desires of the uh, neighbors um, to keep that path as close to what it is as possible, if not exactly as it is, um, then maybe there's a, a, a solution here. So. Um, I guess my point is that um, I'd like to get our position clarified. I'd like to maintain our public access, and I, I totally respect the um, desire to keep that path as close as possible because I can appreciate uh, what that means when you're really familiar with an area and just the kind of smell and the sense of a place when you kind of walk through um, and experience the environment. So. Uh, uh, the factors that really are driving my my judgment on this are that. It's, this is an incredibly complicated uh, and uncertain situation. Uh, and uh, uh, the town has gone to great lengths through its council to analyze the thing. The conclusion is that we have a high degree of risk of losing. That's the bottom line in terms of the legal analysis. Uh, I oppose pouring a lot more money into a high-risk proposition. Uh, it would be my recommendation that we need to know more clearly whether we can achieve the goals that I think we collectively share. Uh, I would think that it would be appropriate to direct, request the town manager to uh, see if we can determine whether an agreement with both of these parties can be reached that's consistent with the various uh, elements that we all agree have to be in the agreement. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, preserving public access is number one. Uh, 
we need to equitably resolve the differences between the condominium associations point of view and mr gendron's we need to make sure that there are no structures built we need to agree have an agreement that the landscaping that is done there is to the town specification and control and that those costs will not be borne by the town over time but that we will have the authority to make sure that it's done in the way that we want I think it needs to be done in an aesthetically attractive way but we also need to minimize the impact on the dune out there and the pathway and to the extent that we can do that is presently unknown because those negotiations have never moved forward to the point of trying to see where the give points are but those are the things that I think are all critical to an agreement and if we could come back with something then I think we would be able to say whether we could accept it or not right now I don't think we know yeah I think I think council Donovan summed it up it's really complex and I'm really conflicted on what to do and I kind of you know counselor Foley I think I kind of agree with it if we do own the screen that's what we're saying what I haven't got a clear answer for and I need to understand more is someone mentioned it from the public comment there's also a precedent setting piece here too there are other avenues in town that have circumstances and what happens here kind of you know dictates what happens down the road I think I agree that I think we should continue the conversations to see where the conversations go sort of as outlined by the things that we just counselor Donovan just outlined but I'm not sure I'm totally okay I'm saying we're not going to pursue the option of taking it to court if we can't get where we need to be so I will leave that option open I think it is worth investing some money to preserve public access to the beach because I think that's going to be an incredibly important issue across all of Maine going forward so I'm kind of on the fence I agree with continuing conversations let's see where they go and evaluate at that point in time but I I'm not okay to completely dismiss saying we may go to court to preserve our rights so like everything that we do there's a risk-benefit ratio for every decision that we make do we determine that we plant our flag in the ground and say we go to court if our number one goal is to maintain public access which I believe it is we decide do we risk losing all of that by going to court and losing because if we do lose we do forfeit all of our rights to that access and they can do basically what they want with it or do we try and find some kind of compromise where we can guarantee what our number one goal is and that's public access the secondary outcome for me is location ideally leave it alone is the perfect solution if we can't achieve that then I certainly would welcome some kind of now that the condo association is involved that's a relatively new aspect of this we're now negotiating with two other parties or two parties instead of one makes it a little more complex in terms of sharing that equity but I do think that that's an option that needs to be looked at and agreed to amongst all three of the parties in terms of precedent we do have other precedents to pursue it the way we're doing it if each street is unique which we've discussed there are three other precedents in the neighborhood Avenue 7 Avenue 6 and Avenue 5 were took very similar approaches with a discontinuance and then easements granted any negotiation that we did however I would want to make sure that all of the town's interests were protected in perpetuity and that there was no way to revoke those interests or undermine those interests short of that then I think we would I would be comfortable pursuing the legal option at that point because at that point if we can't maintain access and that's my number one concern then I would be willing to commit additional resources to it to make sure we maintain that but I'd like to try a negotiation first to see if we can come up with a with a reasonable response council st. Clair oh sorry no um trying to take notes um so I'm sort of kind of in the middle of where everybody is um I strongly believe in not giving up any public access at all zip zero zilch um 
to get to that point, I mean, it's no big secret. I'm always one of the counselors that feels like, oh, we can always kumbaya and come together, and if we just sit down and have a conversation, this will be fine, and we can get there, and we can figure this out just by having a conversation. I realize that that's unfortunately not the way the world works anymore. Um, I think that it's my personal preference, if this was up completely and solely up to me, that we go back to Gendron one more time, see what he's willing to come back with us, work with us on, and then at that point we're done. No more negotiations. We go to court. Um, I think we're wasting time. And we've been talking about this for far too long. It's getting, it's getting tiresome. It's taking up a lot of council time, taking up a lot of business. It's taking up attorney fees. Um, and I'm frustrated by it. Um, this access has been in place for over 50 years. To, for, to, to me, if somebody's, and I realize it's a different situation, but if somebody's taking care of my lawn for over 50 years, he has a right to that section of my lawn. Well, we've been taking care of that strip of land for over 50 years. These people have been accessing that land for over 50 years. It should stay the way it is. That's my preference. Okay. Um, just some points. First is, um, I look at this uh, a little bit differently because of precedence. I'm one of the few counselors that have been here since 2000, 2005, and 7, and actually voted on all three of those discontinuances. So the precedence for me, particularly in, in my position, is that, and I voted in favor of every one of those, is that I'm going to treat it exactly the same way I treated those three previous, unless I see some real issue that changes that, um, then um, it might be differently. I do not see this issue being any different than those other three. Um, I actually think that this issue is less aggressive or, or um, needs to kind of tone down. I have not heard anyone say that access was ever going to be taken away. Council is very clear. I think that if anything, there's definitely a consensus that we will fight to maintain access uh, for the public uh, regarding that. Um, the applicants, and now I believe um, both parties that are of interest are interested in making sure the right of way stays that. So I don't think we need to take an aggressive approach regarding rights away and access to the beach. It's going to stay that way. I think that uh, through this negotiation process where staff will have to um, take all of this information that we've kind of contributed, including the questions that we've gotten from the citizens, and um, do their homework and make a presentation to us uh, for consideration at the council, and that's where we then start forming our opinion regarding that information. Um, I did want to mention that um, um, you know, one thing to keep in mind is that um, we are not um, only setting precedent going forward. A hundred years ago, half the houses that are down at Pine Point weren't actually in Pine Point. <laughs> so, and at some point in time, in every neighborhood in Scarborough, someone did not want their area of town to grow because they wanted to keep it the same way. So it is about making the best judgment for everyone and about for the community as a whole to move forward um, so that uh, we try to uh, achieve some harmony in that process. So um, with that, I did want to say, because no one's mentioned it, I do not agree with arguing um, this half road thing. Mm -hmm. It's either the whole road or no road um, kind of approach. Uh, it's kind of foolish, so I hope that doesn't really come up, but I thought I needed to at least um, say that. And then, so what I want to ask is that, is it, um, is it kind of move this forward for staff, because we have to direct the manager, the, the chair is supposed to direct the manager at the end of one of these, is that the consensus is that we do move this issue mm -hmm. forward to receive a recommendation from our staff um, regarding some type of negotiation, because I have not heard anyone say that we absolutely need to go and fight and say no. Right. Is that a fair assessment? Yes. It is. Yep. So, um, without any specifics, um, and we can talk about how I any of our. I didn't really weigh in, I was still thinking. <laughs> okay. Um, am I open to hearing a another proposal or a, a, a negotiated agreement between the folks at Pine Point and Mr. Jenrin, if they're at that the table together, yeah, I'm open to that. Um, other than that, I, I don't I don't understand why we're doing this. I'm the more I hear, the more uh, I am kind of shocked that it's taking up this much time. Honestly, I um, it's frustrating. Um, so yeah, it's they can come to us with something that pleases everybody and everybody's pretty happy with it and, and we maintain access, then absolutely. 
I, I'm, maybe I'm confused by what you're asking or what you're asking, the direction you're asking. It sounds like you're asking to enter into a negotiation with Mr. Jenner solely. Yeah. So I believe what I and asked. The condo association. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What I asked was, is there a consensus? Now keep in mind, a consensus does not require us to vote. Right. It's, uh, is this the majority of the yeah. majority? The majority of the town council that, agrees yeah. with at least taking this direction. Yeah. We will take a formal vote um, on the public record as part of a regular meeting regarding any recommendation. The direction is to give the manager the authority to begin um, pr uh, pr to begin some type of presentation and recommendation regarding this issue. And that recommendation could be, no, we take it to court. It could be that um, we negotiate um, or we negotiate with Genrin, um, not to name names, but with the applicant um, regarding this issue. And actually, it's the applicant and the condo association, if I'm thinking about this right. As far as the role of any citizen input or citizen group input, that comes, in my view, comes through the public hearing process. It comes through our involvement and our uh, input to the town manager. And believe me, um, they're also inputting directly to the town manager if you kept track of the emails that we're getting. So I think that. Um, views have been shared and they will continue to be shared and open with everyone. So, um, and I think our job as a council is to make sure that the manager takes those into consideration. So if you don't need all of us in total agreement, then yes, you Absolutely. Have, then you have consensus. But I also think we don't have to go to court. We wouldn't be the ones going to court. We would defend our right in court if Mr. Mr. Jennings took us to Correct. court. And there's a big difference there. Yep. For me. Um, yeah. Can I say one thing? I, I think mo most of the people, town council have spoken, have said we need to see something pretty specific to know whether it meets our own. So we, we need to see the negotiation advance to a point where uh, it establishes certain parameters. So, let's, uh, so just keep in mind it's beyond seven and we try to be mindful of all the meetings because we have other people that are here for the next meeting as well. So if we can wrap this up quickly, absolutely. I just, I just want to say something really fast. Um, <clears throat> if you're, <clears throat> because I am working on communication, um, please make sure that if you're talking about this out in the public or on Facebook or in other forms of social media, please make sure that you're quoting truthful statements. Um, and if you don't know exactly what those truthful, state, truthful statements are, please contact Tom and make sure that he's answering your questions. The worst thing that can happen whenever we're in negotiations or we're discussing things like this is false information getting out. And that's happening right now, and that's unacceptable. That only hurts our cause. So please make sure that you're following through and checking up on things. Make sure that what you're telling people is legit. Thank you. Um, other than that, are, are you clear with the direction? Yeah, so I, I, I'm a little unclear in that um, my takeaway here is that there is a consensus opinion that let's see what sort of deal we can put together. So there's a specific proposal for you to consider and react to. That's a bit different than us coming with a recommendation that, uh, well, I suppose if we can't meet the basic terms that I've heard talked around the table, then it, uh, recommendation is do nothing essentially and we'll see right. what happens. Uh, that no action would be required. But our marching orders are to see if we can put a deal together that meets as many, if not all, of the, the sort of uh, expressions of interest uh, around this table tonight. That's exactly how I see okay. it. Okay. Good. Yeah. But, 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 very low, but, but it comes back. <coughs> of course. Yeah. We have to approve it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Continuous yeah, order is yeah, council yeah, action yeah, and yeah. acceptance of easement. All right. With that, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, folks, before you go, um, there is a uh, project grade fundraiser for home heating. Uh, there are uh, 26 of that with the link bag. I'm going to leave now. If you can grab a couple on the way out, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, if you're going to wait for the end, I can tell you what to do. Just, well, if anybody wants them, they can take them. And if not, I'll, I'll try and hand one at the end. <laughs> Oh, Right. Right.
Pauline Levin, you know? Oh, yes, yes. Yes. I really think it would be helpful, though, to advertise when you're going to have a public meeting because it's hard to keep up. You do. I know it's very tough, very tough, because everybody's busy, and I don't want to come to all the council meetings. That's your job. No, no. But I do appreciate your objectivity on all the things I'm aware that you voted on. So thank you very much. No, keep, keep, keep sending emails. That's the only way to keep up. <laughs> no, what you think? He just ran to the bathroom, I think. Will? Yeah. I think he just ran to the bathroom. So if we can, uh, we're all set. I think we're, uh, out. we're live. Okay. <laughs> so I'd like to call to order this meeting of the Scarborough Town Council, February 1st. It's a little after, it's about 7.10. Uh, for the public I, uh, that's watching, I apologize for being late. We had a workshop before this that ran over. And uh, with that, um, I'd like to ask if everyone would stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And for the town clerk, roll call, please. Council Donovan? Here. Council Rowland? Here. Council Foley? Here. Council St. Clair? Here. Council Hayes? Here. Council Chiazzo? Here. Chairman Bayvine? Here. 
And um, this is our opportunity for item number four is general public comments. That is, if you would like to speak on any item that is not on the uh, agenda this evening, you're welcome to step up to the podium and you do have three minutes to speak. Hi, this is Lily Ferguson, uh, 331 Black Point Road. Um, I just have to say something that <laughs> really bothers me about the workshop. Specifically, that the town, the chair of the town council said, we, we want to make it to clear to the public. There has been no negotiation. We're not negotiating with them, um, Mr. Gendron. We're not, okay. The process, again, process is so important. And also honesty about what's been happening is also really important to the public. And I can tell you right now, the people in Pine Point know there's been negotiations going on. So who authorized those negotiations? if it wasn't the full council. You don't have to answer that question. But I will say to you, after you said there was no negotiation, then four councillors started talking about the negotiations. The negotiations we spent money on already, the town's attorney, the money we spent, that poor Mr. Gendron spent $180,000 or some, who knows, I'm estimating, on his beautiful presentation that was done in October that Mr. Donovan saw. So Mr. Gendron has really delved into this. I'm not taking a stand one way or the other, but this process is messed up again. You just gave direction now to the manager and to the, um, without deciding what your risk benefit was, which is great. I think you can give direction to the manager and say, it's you know, go ahead and go negotiate and try to figure this out and work with it and everything. That should have been the very first thing that happened when this Mr. Jenden came to this town. Now, I don't know whose fault that is or whatever, but none of these negotiations that never happened should have ever happened until the town council in its entirety directed the manager and the attorney to do it. That's how you work for the citizens of the town. And it really bothers me for you to sit there and say, we've never had any negotiations. And uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, it was also a very big surprise to the public who is sitting there that we are now claiming this as our road. Everybody read the attorney's um, analysis of it, our attorney's, this is Carborough Town's attorney's analysis, and one counselor said that, well, it concludes the risk is too high, and yet some of the conclusions in that letter don't say that at all. And <laughs> so... I think, please, work on the process of how these things go about happening and, the, the, and be honest and transparent to the public about it. Thank you. Hasn't counted down yet. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Jackie Perry. Knows the red light, green light. I live at 215 Black Point Road and I'm a member of the Board of Education. Please don't take my remarks as criticism at all, but as a suggestion. When legislation comes up for hearing, before you are able to have a meeting and take a stand, you might want to have a protocol for addressing that. LD 129 came to my desk because I'm on the Maine School Boards Association Legislation Committee. That legislation was submitted by Senator Volk and uh, supported by uh, Representatives Vashon and Soraki. If it ever passes, it will be a boon for this community because it addresses the fact that communities who build school buildings without state funds might get some reimbursement for that. I immediately got in touch with the superintendent and I emailed uh, Chairman Babine and Councillor Chiazzo because they're, number one, familiar with legislation, the budget, and debt service. And we've been committed for three years for one budget. Chris was unable to represent the town with his remarks, and he did an excellent job, by the way. And he emphasized how we work together in this town, one budget, one town, and the cost savings that we're trying to achieve. 
The superintendent hit it right out of the ballpark. She did an excellent job, but she had some coaching from Chris. She was able to, at his urging, uh, make an appointment with the commissioner, who wants her to come back and spend more time with him. The committee had nothing but praise for her remarks and want her to come back to, for the workshop on the bill. We had a great, great session. But it would have helped had the Chris or any of you who testify be able to say, I represent the town of Scarborough and its council. Because things like this are going to come up. I got the notice Thursday. I got in touch with them. Chris and I met with the superintendent on Friday morning. So it's just a suggestion. Legislative sessions can be quick and we need to be able to address them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else from the public that would like to speak? Going once, twice, not seeing any. Moving on to item number five, minutes from the January 18th, the 2107, I believe that's 2017 regular meeting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, if I could have a motion. From the council? Uh, motion approved. approved. Thank you. Second. Second. <laughs> Any uh, comments, edits, uh, changes for the <coughs> town clerk that need to be noted? Not seeing any. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. Um, item number six, adjustments to the agenda. Any adjustments from any councilors? Councilor Hayes. Yeah, Chairman, I'd like to offer at least an adjustment to the agenda to put back on the agenda or put an agenda item on for a reconsideration of our conversation around the growth permits. Um, I had voted, I had some concerns, I voted yes last time to, be able to do that, so I'd like to put that, my reason for doing that and thinking about it is in the past week we've had several different articles. So if we could hold off on the opinion piece, we're going to, because it is a debatable motion, so um, if we can get the Chief order number. The minutes, order 17-007. So the motion on the floor is to move to reconsider order number 17-007. Is there a second? I'll second it. There's a second. It's debatable. So I'll turn it over to you to speak. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, so, 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 so my only thinking was when, you know, the last time they've been, we've had several workshops and some things, and I'm just trying to reconcile some numbers. What's kind of happened in the last week is when we had the original workshop, we were talking about 850 or so multifamily units. Last when we were talking to growth, when we were talking here last week, it was 800. The Portland Press had an article that talked about 865. There's been some confirmation that the total number of multifamily in the pipeline are 925. So there's been a lot of different numbers, which I'm somewhat confused about which numbers we're talking about. So if I'm confused, I have a concern that maybe our constituents are. In addition, I attended the planning board meeting this week where it was first, you know, there was a conversation around, you know, the Divine Capital Project. One of the planning board members did express a concern about, geez, has the council really thought about how many, how fast, how quickly? So I just thought I'd convey that, that at least maybe opens it up for conversation. And if we had between now and the next meeting a chance to get to our constituents, I actually got an email from a constituent saying, have we had public meetings? What's the process to get involved? And it just was trying to put it back on to see if, there's, if we can buy some time to try to connect with our constituents to see what they really think. Um, maybe have a conversation among us about, you know, what do we want to do? So that, that was my thinking of trying to put it back on the, as an agenda item tonight. Great. Um, I, I do want to ask a, a consider a point of information. Can the manager clarify the issue around the, uh, the change in the numbers that Councilor Hayes has been uh, focused on um, and, the, and the most recent quote that it's now greater than 900? Can you provide clarity well, to that? Well, it depends how we're characterizing. I believe Mr. Bacon provided a, a wealth of information to you around the number of growth permits that may be necessary. And I think the difference in the numbers being talked about is the total number of units that are have the potential of happening as opposed to the numbers that will need growth permits uh, and, and uh, essentially there were a number of project, projects that were able to obtain their necessary permits late in 2016 in the mm -hmm. last week or so yep. under the annual allocation and therefore were not part of the conversation in needing growth permits. So I don't, if there's discrepancy it's in how it's being worded. No, I think, I, but I think there was some confusion and absolutely agree. When we were talking about 800 
permits going into the pool. That's a different conversation or a point of reference to say, as I understand it, there's 925 potential multifamily units that are in the pipeline. Either already have permits in the process of getting permits or pot would, and, I, and, and again, there's, there's a list here of which projects those are. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that's just a big, there's a big difference between the public hearing conversations around 800 multifamily versus 925. So it's just a point of reference and whether it's worth just finding out from our constituents what they really think and feel about this was, was my thought. Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, can we get a clarification from the town manager as to, this is following up on Councillor Hayes' comment, whether there are any new uh, multifamily units being talked about or is the universe of multifamily units the group that we've all been looking at now uh, these past several meetings? Nothing new in I would say the last 60 days, no. So there's really been no change? Again, the differences would be surrounding whether the ones that need permits as opposed to the, the ones that have potential of happening by way of annual allocation or uh, through other means. Um, uh, Councilor Foley. So we're just, just so I'm clear on process, we're commenting on whether or not we believe we should reconsider this. That's correct. The okay. question on the floor That's is whether or not we should reconsider. Yeah. So I have three three reasons why I support reconsideration uh, at this point. Number one, um, the evening that we met on this, uh, four out of six of us came into the meeting not knowing that it was a one and done vote. And uh, I will admit full-heartedly, I was one of the four. Um, and for me, going and speaking to process and, and being very open with, our, uh, with the public, I think it's really important that as a counselor, I should know what I'm doing. And uh, if I don't know, um, then it, it, to Peter's point, it becomes even more confusing for the council. So now that I know how fast we can do it, because <laughs> we can do it in one meeting, um, I, my original thought was that it had to go like most things do first reading, public hearing, second reading. We essentially had a workshop on December 14th, and then by January 18th, more than tripled the amount of growth permits we allow. The workshop took place during the holidays. A lot of people were not paying attention after what could arguably be called the most contentious presidential election mm -hmm. we've had, which has been a big distraction. So I just feel like the public has not um, had enough time. My biggest concern tonight is that this was not put on this week's agenda. So again, we would be in the same situation where the public wouldn't know we were going to have this conversation. So I really want to have the conversation uh, at least one more time with the public. Also, the last point I was going to say is our, uh, maybe I said this first, our planning board liaison was not able to be with us that evening and he may have some really great insight because he's been to those meetings as well. So those are the reasons why I would support reconsideration. Thank you. How's it Rowan? So <laughs> um, I feel like we had a pretty healthy discussion uh, at the January 18th uh, meeting. Um, um, certainly there was a lot of debate. There was a difference of opinion um, uh, regarding um, not knowing that there was a one and done um, process. Certainly during the time of the debate, we, we were all aware of that. Um, I would also comment that we didn't triple the number of growth permits that were allowed. We added to the reserve pool to something less than 300 growth permits um, Over and to a total of 500. Um, the, um, the other th comment that I would make is that the differences that I saw from the uh, material um, that was presented at the workshop, um, there was a background material that had uh, if you totaled up the number of multifamily housing, it was 845. Uh, the differences were there were, um, I believe, the uh, Muzzy Road project is potentially uh, looking at adding 12 additional units. Um, the, uh, the December 14th document had, um, I believe, the number incorrect on the, for uh, divine, the Divine Capital project it said 280 plus or minus. Turns out it's now, it's actually 288. So that is, uh, Eight, and then there's also reference to a, a 60 uh, unit development at Foxcroft, um, which we didn't have at, at that time. 
um, at, at least on, on that document that I've, I've also heard talked about. So if you add that up, that's 80, and that's the difference between the 845 and the 925. Um, I feel like the refinement in the number of units that are uh, potentially being considered or, or uh, at some stage in the planning process in terms of that they may or may not go forward um, isn't terribly material to whether or not we reconsider this matter because there's a finite number of uh, permits in the growth pool and they will um, they will have to be replenished if they are if that number if it's drained down to zero um, so regardless of which projects there are that are being talked about um, it, it isn't a matter of whether or not excuse me the, the number that are proposed or in a, a, a pipeline um, doesn't really uh, doesn't really matter because there are only 500 growth permits in that reserve pool um, so I, I wouldn't support reconsideration this time. Sorry, I'm taking notes at the same time. Councillor um, St. Clair. Um, I, to me, it does. The number does matter. Um, I sat here in, in support of something because of a number that was put in front of me, and then come to find out that's not the actual number. Um, regardless of whatever the reasons behind those numbers are, is kind of irrelevant to me because the perception of the public. So. We, pre we made a present presentation to the public on a certain amount of numbers <coughs> for these permits, and now we've changed that, and that number has grown by 100. So to me, that's, that's not what I agreed to. So I would support <coughs> um, looking at this again. Reconsideration, sorry. Thank you. Councilor Chiazzo. So I have a couple comments, but I have a, a clarification first. Yes. Um, does the motion for reconsider require a supermajority or a straight majority? Good question, and I'm going to expand the answer, if you don't mind, to kind of cover the whole process. Mm -hmm. So, which will also, um, just to clarify, because it is um, very specific in rules and policy about the process that we undertake. So, um, according to the council's rules and policies on reconsideration, um, the town, um, a person who voted in the favor when it passes affirmatively <coughs> can either uh, submit to the town clerk a request to place an item on the agenda. It has to be placed um, or requested Wednesday before the meeting, no later than 2 p.m. so that it can be on the agenda for approval uh, to be in that following week. Um, if it is not um, undertaken, then the council's policies or rules state that a council who voted in the majority, or by the way, if it's in the negative, it has to be, if it, if it was a tie vote, it has to be someone from the negative. Um, the policy also states, I just lost train of thought. Sorry, what was I talking about? No, I mean, I know I'm talking about rules and policy. No, oh, in, in um, it's about the, about the, so Councilor Hayes has done this properly, asked for a motion uh, for reconsideration. It does require, in order to then move into um, public comments and um, further debate on the original motion, it requires a supermajority of five affirmative votes for reconsideration only. And then when we go to the main motion, that just, again, passes by a simple majority, passes or fails by a majority. So is that process clear? So this vote will require a supermajority in order yes, for Yes, it will require five. And then if it passes, then we actually open up and there's an actual action item and that's the primary motion. And then we have a debate about the qualifications around that. Okay. So can I make comments now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, um, a couple of points. Um, you, you know, the, the argument that four of the six didn't know it was one and done, that was brought up at the meeting. There were two motions to table during the meeting. Both failed. Um, and quite frankly, I, I, I'm still not clear what has changed um, uh, uh, drastically enough for us to reconsider a formal motion and formal approval process that's in policy, that's in ordinance, that we followed to the letter. There doesn't seem to be any extenuating circumstances here that would cause me to support that kind of action. If that were the case, we could basically turn around next week and decide I didn't like what I said last week. I'd like to reconsider that um, and open everything up again. So um, I'm not convinced there's anything here that would require reconsideration. Thank you. Any other council? Council Donovan? Uh, I was not here at the last meeting, but I watched it live streaming, so I did see uh, what happened. Uh, uh, and I listened carefully to hear whether the case was made for reconsideration, because re reconsideration normally involves that there are compelling new circumstances that would justify it. Uh, the number of units 
uh, I think is, uh, I think that's uh, uh, not the case. All the units have been known. Anyone paying attention knew all of the projects that are in the pipeline and they've all been identified as a part of the submissions that we've received and the uh, uh, presentations by Dan Bacon. Uh, it's been publicized in the newspaper. Uh, we've gotten no uh, pushback. My emails have been virtually absent any criticism of it. The uh, uh, reaction at the planning board earlier this week, there was not a single member of the public who came and said, slow this down, send this back. The planning board itself uh, unanimously supported the project. There was virtually no pushback uh, at the planning board meeting. So uh, I think it's a bad practice uh, to reconsider uh, on such thin grounds have been represented. I was happy to listen, but uh, I think it sort of indicates that we don't know what we're doing. Uh, and that, and that's, uh, I think that's a very bad message to send to people who are looking to us for permit approvals. So I won't, I won't support this. Any other comments? Uh, well, I would just add, um, you know, from the planning board's perspective, I get, you know, the planning board doesn't set policy. They look at a project in and of itself and uh, kind of discuss the merits of that project. And if we were in that, their seat, um, I'm all about the Haigas project. I think that's a fantastic project. I think the Haigas Parkway has been an unfulfilled pr promise for our, our town for a long time. So from a project perspective, I'm not concerned. It's the 30,000 foot view that I'm concerned about in terms of the whole uh, process of vetting, you know, the increase of the number of, and maybe it wasn't two thirds, but going from roughly three to 500 to 900 is a significant difference in my opinion one that would have been better vetted through the ordinance process, um, but we didn't have that luxury of that. But there was uh, comments by people on the planning board who um, asked the council to be very careful and to consider um, that $30,000 $30, view. I wish it was $30,000. The 30,000 foot view um, versus just the project. So I'm differentiating myself from the project and putting myself into the big picture. When, so that's my but I get it, and we can move on. <coughs> so I just wanted, again, to talk about the numbers. The growth permits are in the reserve pool, based on the action that we took at the last meeting, are now 500. We didn't triple them. It's not 900. It's 500. When they're exhausted, they're exhausted unless this council acts again. So there is a limit to the amount of building that can be done based on the action that we took at the last meeting. So I'd like to move this forward. I, I, just a, a quick uh, comment. I agree with um, Council Donovan um, in particular. I don't believe anything materially has changed. Um, information has not changed. The projects have not changed. It, what has changed is people's interpretation of personal, uh, the data, and they're defining it the way that they want to. And so um, other than that, there has been no, nothing materially to change the five to one vote that occurred at that last meeting. With regard to people not knowing, particularly counselors not knowing what uh, is happening, um, I believe the five to one vote must have answered any confusion because it was your responsibility to speak up and say that you were confused. Um, and so a five to one vote tells me that we acted appropriately. And um, with that, I did want to um, call the question and uh, all those in favor of reconsideration, and there must be five votes in the affirmative um, for this to move forward. Otherwise, we will move on to the next item. So all those in favor of reconsideration, please raise your hand. That's three, all opposed. Four. Motion fails. Moving on to item number seven, treasurer's warrants. We'll do that as the um, uh, day goes on. And number eight is a presentation of the 2016 municipal and school audit. Apologize to our guests um, for that uh, slight delay, but uh, what we are doing is actually we're going to kind of move from here into uh, joining seats with our school board uh, colleagues and uh, staff to go over the 2016 audit. Because um, I believe there's going to be a presentation. Yes. So, uh, so that's why we're moving over. So if everyone can have a seat and come to the table.
We can uh, get uh, moving. Uh, try to push this along. What I'd like to do is to go around um, and not for town council. Well, actually, I should for town council members. Just in case, is have everyone just introduce themselves. Um, I know that you've been here in the past, I believe, right? I have not actually. Oh, because you look familiar. Well, and I haven't <laughs> seen you before, so I think it would be nice to know who's who and what board we sit on. So, uh, Councilor Hayes, can you start? Yes, I'm, I'm Peter Hayes. I'm chair of the Finance Committee of Scarborough Town Council. Welcome, everybody. Okay. Kate St. Clair, I'm vice chair of the council. Chris Chiazzo, a member of the Finance Committee, Town Council. And I'm on the Town Council I'm Chairman. Jackie Perry from the Board of Education. Tom Hall, Town Manager. Darlene Kukas, I'm Manager at Mac Page. Uh, Chad Dudley, and uh, I've worked on both audits of the town and the uh, school. Julie Kukenberger, Superintendent of School. Ruth Porter, Finance Director, Town of Scarborough. Tom Spash, I'm the Senior Representative. Kelly Murphy, Chair of the School Board. Jody Shea, Board of Ed, uh, Finance Chair. Uh, Will Rowan, uh, Scarborough Town Council. Jill Donovan, Town Council. Katie Fuller, Town Council. Kate Bolton, Hender Outer of Scarborough <laughs> 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 And the, uh, and the business manager, business manager for department. the school department. <laughs> so um, I do want to remind everyone, so uh, if you can speak up, because these do not amplify, so we do have some citizens, so if you can speak up when you're doing the presentation and comments, that'd be great. But I'd like to turn, uh, turn it over to Councilor Hayes for the council. Um, any opening comments or uh, to direct us? As no. chair of finance? Uh, I'd just like to welcome everybody, and I think this is kind of, we do this every year, kind of a, a joint presentation of the financial statement, I think. Um, it was great news, and they'll kind of walk us through the presentation. It was a it was a really clean audit, and we'll talk about some of the things we've asked our guests to highlight some things. In particular, there are some questions that were asked or sent to us by a constituent that will be woven into the conversation. I think we've had some conversations. There's some unusual. There's one unusual thing that happened around retirement benefits that will pension benefits that we'll talk about. Um, and so with that, I'll I'll turn it over to. Well, thank you for walk having us through the process. Um, Christian Smith is the principal on the engagement. He's traveling, so he's unable to be here this evening. Um, we work for the county firm, Mac Page, and we perform the municipal audit and the school audit. Um, one thing we'd like to go over initially is just kind of get an understanding of um, our relationship. So basically, as independent auditors, we work for the council or the school board. We work with management to perform um, the audit. And so management prepares the financial statements. We audit those financial statements and express an opinion on those. Um, we do assist with some of the financial statement um, preparation, um, and we can touch more on that because it's kind of an odd arrangement um, where you're using full accrual, which is more like a business than fund accounting. But we'll touch on that in a little bit. Um, so. Auditor's opinion is an unmodified opinion. That's a clean opinion. That's the highest assurance that we can give. Um, the financial statements are fairly stated, um, and they've been presented in accordance of GAAP with the generally accounted, uh, accepted accounting principles, which is basically how all businesses are reported. Um, we, re we issue a number of different reports. Um, we issue a SAS 114 letter. That is a separate communication. And, um, it basically goes over what the audit procedures are. Um, it's a standard letter. Um, there were no issues in performing the audit. There were no disagreements with management. Um, there were no new account, uh, accounting statement, uh, statements that were um, woven into the financials this year in FY16. Um, management letter. So we issued a management letter for the town and the school department. Um, we also had financial report, uh, reports for both. We also did a single audit, which was on the HIDA grants, and we had no findings with those. Um, we also, regarding the school, the State of Maine Department of Auto Procedural Form, uh, recommendation of MEDEM's upload of financial report and compliance 
with the Maine School Finance Act. Um, so we had no compliance issues um, regarding the Maine School Financial Act, and we had no issues. Uh, we issued a standard report. Um, so that's quite a bit to be issued um, through the process. Moving along, I uh, just kind of want to touch on um, some of the management letter comments. We'll start off with the town first. Um, you did not have all of these. I just want to touch on the different levels. On um, the highest level is material weakness. Um, that is when things are not being, material items are not being um, reported correctly. Um, the next highest level are significant deficiencies. So they're, they're not really material, but there's some issues going on within the recording. Lowest level is a control deficiency. Um, it could be referred to like improving or a best practice item. And that's what we had um, for the town. We had two different pre uh, best practice or improvement areas. One was performance bonds. Um, we recommend that they implement a formal policy and procedure to review the status of the performance bonds regarding if the project is done, um, you know, should the funds be returned, wh what is the status? So just making sure that they're up on that. Um, and this year we looked at a lot of communities on that one and we found little things on all of them. So Scarborough's not alone, it's just there's a lot going on and things, you know, just the policy and procedures, so there's a routine process to clear those. Um, the other one is exposure to uh, custodial credit risk. And basically we recommend uh, implement a formal deposit policy and obtain necessary collateral. So on that one, it's just in a bank, they'll cover 200, you know, FDIC, 250,000, obviously. Municipalities have more than that, so you get collateral to cover those. Just a timing item where some things just were exposed for a short period of time. Um, I believe they were collateralized very soon thereafter, so there was no issue. It's just making sure that you know there is security in those investments um, and cash items. Uh, both recommendations, management agrees and plans to implement the necessary changes um, with those. The next one, management letter comments to the school department. Um, again, two best practice recommendations, so just process improvements. One with school nutrition reporting. Um, the number of meals reported for one month, um, one of the school's meal counts were reported twice, and one school, the number of meals were left out. So it was just kind of a, uh, an error. It was unintentional, it just happened. Um, so our recommendation is just to have two people reviewing things, because when we brought it up, they, were, they recognized quickly, they knew what had been ha what happened. Um, so it's just two people, two sets of eyes before things are submitted. Um, just a good, good practice. The other one's cash receipts um, regarding the school nutrition program. Um, and just um, the policy requires two initials to indicate uh, dual verification of the cash receipts and deposit. Um, we only saw one initial. Um, the, the pro two people are involved. We just like to see both initials on uh, like the deposit details. So that there are two people going through counting the deposits, agreeing on the amount that is put on the deposit slip so goes to the bank. Um, do, do you mind if we ask questions as we go along? That's perfectly that way fine. dealing with the topic yeah. and not waiting until the end? No, that's fine. Um, on both the town and the school regarding yeah. best practices, are they new um, announcements or new um, items or are they repeat from last year? Um, the school nutrition reporting, that was just this year. We okay. hadn't had a problem with that in previous years. The cash receipts, I believe, we had noted last year as well um, regarding the signatures. Um, and on the town side? Yep, the town side. These uh, are new this year. These were new. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yes, feel free to ask questions at any yeah. time. <laughs> Not a problem at all. Um, so just basically going over the financial statements and how to read them, which it's going to be a high level review because it's, there's a lot going on in there. And, you know. Um, so the first item is the transmittal letter. And if you have your financial pack statements with you, um, that is page 1 through 11. And just one item I'd like to point out is in the fourth paragraph. Sorry, what's that? No, that's fine. Um, in the fourth paragraph is just the Government Office, uh, Finance Office Association of the United States 
GFOA, awarded the Certificate of Achievement and Excellence for Financial Reporting to the town past years. But part of the CAFR program Scarborough is involved with, and within the CAFR it requires additional information that is not required in your standard financial package. So they do go through the process of this additional information in the town report um, that isn't required, but it is something that they go through. Um, so we go through it, make sure it's clean. Then um, someone, another party, they go through and make sure that our financial statements, the town's, uh, the town's financial statements are in requirements to get that excellence. So they'll find out down the road. Um, just wanted to point that out that they do go through that process. Um, our opinion report is on page 17. Um, and it lists our opinion. And like I said, it was a clean, unmodified opinion, clean opinion. Um, moving on, and management discussion and analysis. Um, that is a section for management that they are able to go through and kind of lay out their own, um, lay out, it's a set process, but kind of try to make it more understandable for the average reader to understand what is going on in the municipality during that year. Um, and it all ties back to the financial statements that are in the back. Um, so it just kind of breaks it down into maybe a little more um, highlight form instead of just looking at some numbers in the back. So moving right along, we're going to go to the, the accounting statements themselves. So on page 39, we're going to have the government-wide financial statements, which is 39 and 40. Those are full accrual financial statements. So those are comparable to like a business where you have all the fixed assets, you have all the debt on the books, you have pension liabilities on the books. It's a requirement um, as part of um, general um, as the CAFR. Um, then you also have the fund financial statements, which are on 41 and 42. And those are modified accrual cash. So those, that's a hybrid between cash and full accrual accounts. So some things are, when you receive cash, you pay cash, and other ones are in accrual. Um, then we also have on 44, and that's the general fund, and that is the budgetary basis, and that is a modified cash accrual. Um, and then we have the, fun, uh, the fiduciary funds, which is on page 45 and 46, and those are modified accruals as well. And then the supporting footnotes that go along um, with the the financial statements that have uh, additional disclosures or break out um, the numbers that are listed in the financial exhibits themselves. So it provides some additional uh, information to the readers. Chris, can I interrupt? Uh, would I be taking this down a very uh, ugly path if I were to ask for a layman's explanation of the difference between the accrual and cash basis? So a cash basis is, if you're running a business, is when you physically pay cash or receive cash, and accrual is when you've like performed a service, so you can record the revenue because you expect to get paid and you'll have like receivables. So it's basically, or you know, when you've incurred the expense, you record it, not when you've paid the expense. So for financial statement purposes, ca the cash basis is not allowed. It, it's more of the full accrual basis that you see if you look at. Um, publicly traded company as a full accrual because their idea is to give a, a better picture of what actually went on in the year because you may have done some work in one year but you don't get paid the next so that wouldn't be recorded in the cash basis where in the accrual you're going to record your receivable and your revenue in the year that you did the service so and then in the modified accrual it's a little combination of both <laughs> so where we might book the payables right away and that becomes the accrual piece, mm -hmm. but most of the revenues are on a cash basis. Gotcha. And I think it ultimately it's a question of timing. It's mm -hmm. how you present what your snapshot is on June 30th. Mm -hmm. Is it a snapshot of, of just cash, or is it a snapshot of what you know is promised or, or intended to arrive? Gotcha. And there's a material difference between a modified accrual and a modified cash. That makes sense. Yes. Because yeah. you look at the financials and you'll be like, these numbers are somewhat different. Yes. That makes okay. sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, can, can you explain um, why we do it three different ways? 
it's required. Um, <laughs> GASB, which oversees the the financial statement preparation. Um, I, we were talking about that earlier. We think it was early 2000s that they decided that they would put in the government wide, which is the full accrual, um, to make it easier for the readers of the financial statements because then it was more comparable to a business. Mm -hmm. So it's co government accounting finance. Yeah. That right. yep. compliant. So that's what we're complying with, and it's just they think it it's a it clears it up for people, but I think <laughs> it muddies much. it muddies the water as well because there's a lot going on in your financial statement. Thank you. I, yep. I was Thank wondering you. if this might be a moment, and you can stop me if I'm wrong, but I wanted to just mention why there's a separate school audit. Um, there's a separate booklet which these mm -hmm. folks are kind enough to prepare for us because there are other stakeholders involved in the mm -hmm. school where we're we're reporting out to the Department of Education, state and federal. And they've got some reporting requirements that aren't part of what's in GASB for municipalities. They've got some specialty pieces. So these folks are nice enough to present it in, in even in yet another way mm -hmm. so that just the school is broken out as its own department, even though we're really not separate financially. Right. Yeah. yeah. Another way. <laughs> um, there are no uh, new accounting pronounced. If, are there any more questions? I'm sorry. No. Okay. Um, there were no new accounting pronouncements, so there were no new um, ways that we had to report anything within the financial statements or um, significant disclosure items in this year. Um, but going forward, we have a couple um, new pronouncements that we're going to be dealing with. One of them is GASB 75, which is going to deal with um, OPAB, which is Other Post-Employment Benefits Liability, which mostly is healthcare-related um, benefits. And that, so that's required in June of 2018. What that's going to do is it's similar to the pension requirements. So we're going to have to book the full liability of what an actuary estimates to be the full liability for the, the town. Um, so right now we're thinking it's an additional million dollars. So um, that will go on the government wide, the full accrual financial statement. So that will come on in 18. Um, and then there's also GASB um, 77. Sorry, I got a quick yeah. Does that, we're going to require us to have a collateral offset for that? I don't believe there's a requirement for that at this Fine. time. <coughs> um, I have one municipality that has done that, um, but their liability is vastly larger than what this town sees. So they have it was a big number we put on there, government-wide financial statement. Are there any kind of recognized guidelines that say if you're within this range, you should have X amount of reserves, or if you're above or below this, you're, you're okay to just record it? And You know what I'm saying? Is yeah. There, is there I, I am not 100% sure at this time. Okay. I'm um, sorry to say. No, no, fair enough. That's, yep. It's coming. I just want to yep. try and wrap the head around it. Yeah, because, I mean, with the pension, you know, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but... Um, Right now, there you don't have. There's no funding because it's based off an actuarial estimate, and I will talk about that in a little bit because <coughs> things change quite quickly, and it's just a matter of the market and what that's doing. But um, not that I'm aware of it at this time. Okay. Uh, so yes. If I could, yes, the, the other post-employment benefits that mostly pertains to health insurance is really for those organizations who, after a person retires the organization continues to pay for their health insurance. We don't do that. However, our current premium are implicitly helping to support the folks who are retired. So that's the piece that we're talking about. The actuarials will go through it. I, I think that's the same with the school. Yeah, mm -hmm. we don't, um, we don't um, directly fund any retirement benefits, but, or health but the benefits. fact that we're all in the same pool impacts the value of that benefit to the retiree. So yeah, that and and there's sort of a a calculation of a number rather than an actual cost to the to the district or to the town. And when you say we don't fully fund it, what you mean is that they they have the op option to buy it once they retire. Once I quit working, the town will stop paying for my health insurance, the employer's portion of my health insurance. But you could still purchase it from I the town. I could still purchase my own at 100% of the premium. But there are some organizations who will continue to pay the employer's portion even after the employee retires. Gotcha. Yeah. And there is a, a philosophical belief that 
because we're all in the same pool together that the employer is still benefiting that retiree by getting a, a group rate instead of going out and purchasing something on the market. So there's a value to that. Okay. And um, GASB 77, effective the same year. That one um, is just disclosure information about the nature and magnitude of tax abatement. It doesn't affect the exhibits or the financial statements. It's more of a disclosure item back in the footnotes. Um, so tax, tax abatements are, when I first heard that term, I thought it was a property tax owner who was getting a reduction in their property taxes. What they really mean is more to do with credit enhancement agreements or, or TIFs. That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> Very good point, actually. Yeah. <laughs> GASB 76 just doesn't apply to towns or? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right over there. They threw that one out. Yeah, they threw that one out. Somebody's been retired. Uh, yeah. 76 is. Probably already been put in place. I can't remember which one. <laughs> yeah, I can't. I'm sorry. Um, so the next couple of slides, just kind of looking at the general fund balance growth over the last three uh, years. Um, if we go to if we go to page 44, um, and this is the budgetary basis of the general fund, where we have the original budget amount, the final budget amount, and the actual actual financial results. Um, you can just look down at the bottom. The fund balance end of the year, the 14 million 174. We're just kind of showing you the trend that's going. Um, so obviously. The net change in the fund balance is a positive one um, going up. Um, most of the increase is due to the school fund balance, um, and that has to do um, with the, uh, the Wentworth, Wentworth School mm -hmm. uh, sitting through there. So that, that is why it's up, and obviously there's plans for th those funds. Um, so you can just kind of take a quick look down. You can see, you know, for the total revenues, um, the final budgetary amount to the actual, and see the positive variances, the total expenditures, um, and just kind of come down to the net change in fund balance for the year, which was a, a positive amount. So um, just kind of shows you that staying within budget. Um, the educational one, again, that looks a little strange, um, just because there's. 2.5 million, but again, those are the bond funds. Um, so that does look a little different, but that's just what's flowing through this year. Um, so then, you know, that's looking at this, trying to decide, well, how, how does that stack up? So the next slide, just kind of, you know, is it too much, too little? Just kind of showing you a few other communities, the unassigned fund balance um, as a percentage of um, budgetary expenditures just kind of showing where you fall in um, in that area. Now, Scarborough, you, you have you have a new policy. We yeah. just updated our policy okay. this fall. Right, and it was 8.3, and you've gone to 10%. So going forward. Um, so slide 10, is that policy? The unassigned? No, that's actually. <laughs> Because I wanted yeah. to ask, I thought I saw a report, and I apologize if I didn't bring all my finance. Oh. My finance I thought we were over 10%. Who's talking? Ruth? That might be the total that we're looking at, because the mm -hmm. total fund balance is higher than the... I, yep. thought, I thought the NSI oh, piece was over 10, almost 11. Yeah. So it's 10 by way of uh, how we calculated okay. our policy. I'm not sure I'm bringing the way it's represented it here. Yeah. It's it's this is unassigned. Yeah, we include in, 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 we include more than just our unassigned. We okay. include committed mm -hmm. and yeah. assigned. Yeah. Okay. On um, actually page 41, you'll actually see the unassigned <coughs> amount, which is 6.1. And, and we're talking just general fund here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Six point, I'm sorry, 6.1? 6.1. Six point one. Okay. Jackie's talking to my ear. I couldn't hear you. <laughs> 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 um, so the next couple slides just look at um, you know property tax revenue growth over the past three year trend. Um, the next slide is just looking at um, other revenue stream sources. Um, you can see that excise tax that's a you know what we're seeing across the board basically is people are buying newer cars, leasing cars, they're more expensive, so that's driving up the excise tax in most communities. Yes? 
Chad, sorry, the state revenue sharing, is that municipal and school combined? Uh, no, school no, that's just that's state revenue is sharing is municipal. That's state yeah. only. And oh, state subsidy. Yeah, yep. Sorry, sorry to say that one. now. Oh. Yep. That's okay. Sorry, sorry. Um, so, and do you have any? No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, just kind of looking at where, you know, the other rev major revenue sources that are coming in um, into the community. I have a question about that. I, th I thought our state education subsidy was more like three and a half million. This yeah. has it got it at four and a half. It's it's because of our what years we're in right now. Oh, fiscal this is report current about year. This is last year. Thank you. Yeah. So in Very the helpful. current fiscal year, we're at about 3.5 million. Thank you. So Kate and I actually mm -hmm. talked about this earlier today. I think what can be confusing is that we're reflecting on mm -hmm. FY16. We're in the middle of FY17 mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. planning for FY18 yeah. all in the same day. Auditors live in the past. <laughs> 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 you live in the past, you're planning for the future. So <laughs> it does get a little confusing when these at times. Um, all right. Um, so then just moving along to the next one, major expenditure is just looking at education um, in the last three years. In 16, that has declined a little bit, but again, that's the debt service being paid out of the CIP fund. Um, so the expenditures are still there. It's just it's okay. just sitting in a different fund. Um, and so this, this is general fund on this chart. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That is excellent. Um, and then just looking at the general fund major expenditure trends um, for the town over the last three years. Um, you know, majority of budget are in line and. Like I pointed out earlier, the education one looks a little different, but again, it's the bond fund is rolling through this year. Any questions? No? Okay. Um, so now just a quick overview of the financial statements for the school department. And that is a different pack. This one's not quite as large. Um, auditor's report is on page one and two. Um, there is no MDNA that is uh, included in this one. It does not um, qualify our opinion. We still unqualified opinion on the financial statements of the schools. Um, right there, it talks about because the school department is not a legally separate entity, it does not own the capital assets and debt is in the town's name. So there's only two bases of accounting. So we don't have the full accrual here. We have the modified accrual basis and the modified cash basis. So that clears. And we don't have the management now because it's still part of the town. Yes. So that applies to us as well. Yes. So this, again, the, the takeaway is everything looks good. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does. Everything looks good. It, it, does, look, it does look good. Um, you know. Uh, the footnotes support the schedules, just like the other one, um, the other package. Um, so if we look at page four, and we're looking at the governmental funds, we can see the general funds. And if we look under expenditures, there's debt service and other commitments. And under the general fund, there's 3.7 million. And under the major uh, non-major capital funds project, there's about 1.4. Um, so again, that is the debt fund sitting out in a CIP account, which in total it goes to the 5.1 million, which if you turn the page to page five to the budget, if you look under debt service and other commitments, when you look at the actual, it's mm -hmm. not in line with budget, but again, it's that 1.4 million that's sitting in that CIP fund. So that's really the only one thing that's really different this year um, that kind of jumps out at, at the readers. Um, when they're looking at this. Um, if we go to the next slide, thank you. Um, we're just looking at general fund, budgetary basis, fund balance. Um, it sounds like a broken record. It's up this year, but again, it's the Wentworth bond so fund. So my recollection is there's some kind of limit in terms of the school budget about how much fund balance you can carry. Is that? There is a limit. Um, under statute, we can't carry more than 3% of our budget into um, the ensuing year unless we then use it within a two-year or three-year period depending on how it's applied to um, push it back into spending. And I'm sure 
probably most people at the table remember that when we created that extra fund balance by using Wentworth funds instead of budgeted funds for debt service, the strategic plan was to then in the ensuing year be able to rely on those funds in unassigned fund balance to support an upcoming budget in 18 or 19 when we were anticipating loss of subsidy again. Um, they had kind of relaxed that rule, have they? They did waive it. it um, they waived it during the economic downturn from 2009, I think, up through last year. And then just last year, they decided that you know people were back on a healthy trajectory again, and that they should probably start enforcing. It. So as of last year, it is, the statute is in place, but they do have flexibility in terms of how much time you have to spend that down. So basically, the school target is to keep. 3% of our budget or less in unassigned fund balance, but we do have a plan to get back to that spot, and that's where we typically lay um, in, a, in a typical fiscal year. Thank you. Uh, and the next slide is just again looking at unassigned fund balance for school department. It does say town off to the top right, but please disregard that. That <laughs> should not be there. Um, just kind of looking at um, stacking up to other communities. Um, and then the next one is just looking at major expenditure trends within the school department as well over the last three years. Mm -hmm. And debt service is down a little bit, but that's a function of... Are there any questions? <coughs> no? Okay. Um, one question that had come up. I, actually, I did have a question. Sure. Uh, so I noticed we used different uh, comparables in, in the towns uh, when we did the, the town comparison. Any comment on why we used? So when, so I believe when we were doing the, yeah. yeah. Oh. Before we used Falmouth and. Rhu twenty one Kenny Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yep. So I just kind of took it. You just grabbed a couple parts. Yep. So it's. My guess was these are the guys you audited most recently. <laughs> you had the numbers <laughs> flying around. Look at the terrible. Going back to the town. <laughs> 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 um, Chad, you can kick me later. No, no, we're fine. There, there's been a question <laughs> regarding. Um, so this is a full Corolla financial statements again. Page I'm on page 39. Sorry about that. <laughs> In the town. Maybe um, you drop to page 23, which is that first bullet, which really kind of starts. It's sort of the oh, analysis. Yes. Yep. And, and what I asked for kind of an explanation, if you yep. look at the first bullet, it says the assets of town of Scarborough exceeded its liabilities. There was an increase in the pension of $2.7 million, which looked like a big number. Mm -hmm. And so maybe you could speak to yep. a little bit about why and yep. how and what that reflects. And So the, pen, the pension is basically based off an actual estimation report that we use um, that Maine PERS has they have their auditors come in, they go through, they come up with the numbers, they come out with the proportionate share for the communities and all that. Um, so basically what happens is, so it's based off a of census and it's also based off of market returns. So this is over a long period of time. So what you can see is if the market does well, the liability comes down. If it goes up, I mean, if the market comes down, the liability goes up, and if the market goes up, the Right. Yeah. 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 So, kind of what the pension liability has done. So, in F, it was required in FY15, but we had to book a um, prior period adjustment back to the 14, so the fund balance. So, for 14, they were saying the liability was about $5.3 million. Then in FY15, it was $2.7 million. So, good year in the market on what they were using. Then in 16, we're back to $5.4 million. So it looks kind of strange when you have these swings, but you're no different than any other community if they're in Maine PERS or if they have a private pension. Um, wild swings, and it's all due to just the changes in what the market is doing, because um, obviously management's doing nothing different. You know, the census data is involved, but it's just looking long-term on market, like the market's down, then it's going to take 
you know, we need more funding to be able to get the gains to pay the liability. So, um, yeah, is it fair to say that that's um, not a true liability to the town because you book the, the credit and the debit offsetting in the financial statement? It, it, I mean, I guess I, I don't mean it's not a true liability, but it's not something that we're expected to fund. No, there's no, you don't need to fund it. It's basically as if, say, as of 630, uh, 630.16, the town of Scarborough decides to shut down, that would be your liability. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's going to happen. So next year, that liability is probably going to swing again based on how the market is doing. Um, so, you know, a lot, a lot of um, finance directors are frustrated with that number just because it, it can swing wildly and it's based off of actuary estimates and that's what we're required to use. But the value that has to be booked but it's not a bill that's really due. It's not this time. Yeah. And, and, and that number, sorry, that number is going to change with GAS B75, right? Uh, the OPEB liability. The OPEB liability. Yeah. It'll add on to it. It'll it add on to the that. liable. Yeah. 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 yeah, the liability. So if we look at, so if I can jump back to page 39, so if we're looking at the unrestricted, which is a credit balance under the governmental activities right at the bottom for net physician, a lot of that is just driven by, for the government wide, we have to book the, all the debt, all the pension liabilities. We have to um, post closure landfill liability. We have to book um, accrued uh, compensation. So as we do that, it starts driving down this unrestricted number. So what really took it into the negative was just the pension swing this year. So again, as of June 30, 2016, if this town shut down, that is a liability, but most likely that number is going to change mm -hmm. just because mm -hmm. market's been good so far, but you never know. Um, so that is kind of a, um, an interesting question that comes up quite frequently. So um, two questions yes. regarding this. So there are a lot of citizens watching this going, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they have no <laughs> idea what we're talking okay. about. So um, why is this change important? Um, well, let me back it up first. Yep. Um, you said it, it changes to the fluctuation of the market. Which market? Mm -hmm. um, are they measuring it too? So, because it seems like it just goes up and down like this. So what market is the, it? The investment, so the okay. stock market. The stock market. Yep. And then the second question is, why is it important to the town to be focusing on the net change? Um, <coughs> basically, I mean, you want to see a positive change. You know, for your unrestricted, you want to see a positive number there. but for the full accrual basis, just because we're required to put all the liabilities and all the fixed assets on the books, because when you flip back into more of the governmental fund, those items are not there. Um, it's just when we have to make that jump. So if you look at page 41 at the bottom, you can kind of see where these are the numbers that we're bringing forward into the government wide. So we have the capital assets, we have the bonds payable, um, capital leases, landfill liability, uh, compensated absences. So basically we're taking the fund balance and then we have to add or subtract these assets and liabilities to come out with a fund balance that then that uh, goes back to the net position, excuse me, on page 39. Sure. So that's kind of how we get there is on page 41 is that reconciliation for the net position and then on page 43 is the reconciliation for the revenues and expenditures. Yeah. So is it fair to say that um, this issue does impact probably credit agencies review and assessments for us based on the capital position that we're in? I wouldn't think that they would really have no impact no. on ratios when they consider. No, I don't. Okay. okay. No, I mean again, you know, everyone's going through the same thing. Oh yeah. And we have a couple uh, other municipalities that they're unrestricted credit. It's big. Okay. So, I mean, this is something that can work itself out with just the market itself. And, and just, you know, the reason why I'm asking yeah. is that being on the finance committee on the town side and, and with the help of the school, mm -hmm. we're looking at metrics to mm -hmm. how to truly look at trends and what yep. impact and we're using a lot that are impacted or influenced by credit agencies. Yep. So I want to kind of see if there was a correlation between the two. That's all. I think, I think, you know, where it does matter, I think something to talk about, we've actually started talking about the finance committee too, is 
this really is an unfunded liability that's coming down the road. So at some point as we think about, and if you look at page 39, you look at our net position, this is actually showing that we have a, you know, we have a deficit of unrestricted funds for the pension liability. So at some point, we've talked about this saying we want in a good year start putting some money into funding some of these, these liabilities that are coming down the road. It's just a conversation to have, but they're probably going to grow in time. Mm -hmm. And yep. so it's just something to be aware of and to have that conversation about what do we want for a policy around some of these, yep. you know, unfunded liabilities, accruals that we have to do because of these dudes. Um, I have a question just because I'm staring at slide 17, and I don't know if people at home are still staring at it or not, but <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, I'm wondering if it's an accounting practice or planning for the future that you would do differently. So I'm looking at the big red and the big Kenny Bunk mm -hmm. blue, and Westbrook and Sanford are obviously higher receivers of mm -hmm. CPA. Yep. So is that an accounting practice that we would necessarily have a higher unassigned fund balance that we in our planning because we are not as reliant on state funding? I think this is an anomaly. Typically we would be at the 3% level though, which is significantly mm -hmm. higher than what you're seeing for Stanford and West. Right. We'd be at between 2 and 3. Mm -hmm. So I do think that strategically in the past five years at least, we've tried to build sufficient fund balance so that we can use it then in ensuing years as an offset in revenues to reduce property tax requirements. So. This year is just a sort of a big outlier year of the same type of strategy, mm -hmm. and it, you're correct that it, it's, a, uh, I believe, appropriate for Scarborough to try and mitigate loss of outside revenue. That's been an issue for us by conserving fund balance and using that in, in ensuing years. Okay, thanks. Do you think that's why the town of Falmouth fund balance, if you remember, it was way up there mm -hmm. compared to the rest of us? Do, mm -hmm. Is it because maybe they're funding some of this pension stuff? That I can't tell you. Um, I don't know. That's an interesting question. Because if we were yeah, starting to fund it, that yeah. what mm -hmm. would happen with yep. our fund balance right. would start to yep. increase. Because exactly. we don't have an offsetting liability to technically post it to. Mm -hmm. Would it be unrestricted though at that point if we were putting it toward a... But you recall that the school department, you were on the board, <coughs> we had to start yep. funding the <coughs> unfunded liability. Yeah, and that was the teacher accrual at that <coughs> time, which was the summer, summer, summer payroll, and that was a big issue for us. And we, Huge. We, we I opposed it, but... <laughs> well, yeah. So yeah. My, my question is, though, if we were putting it toward the uh, the pension fund, would it still be unassigned, so then it would count on that slide? So it, it would go through the restricted, but the what it kind of... But then it would land in... It would still land in total fund balance. Yeah. It would just be restricted. Right. Would it be yeah. restricted. Yeah. So it would pull from the unrestricted, yeah. so that would become Don't more of a positive out. number, yeah. and then you'd have this restricted portion that would be sitting down there. That makes sense. Love me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like this, right? Right. So if you get unrestricted and restricted, uh, as you put more in the restricted, your unrestricted comes down and your restricted goes up. Because well, a lot of that has to do with the same it. source, though. I mean, wouldn't and unless, we be both? unless we put money in, well, we'd have to put more money in to do that yeah. to bring both up. Because a lot of that's due to the pension liability. So now you have an offset to liability with the restricted. So it's gonna offset the true liability because you take the liability less whatever assets and then you have a new net number that's less so hopefully the unrestricted will become more composite. So Unfortunately okay. I think the volatility of that particular liability from one year to the next, yeah. I mean you see the huge swing. Oh, yeah. That means if we fund the liability at five million dollars this mm -hmm. year and it changes to two million dollars next year then that goes back into unassigned. Mm -hmm. So there's a yep. lot of back and forth that you would have to manage to match that liability number on June 30 in, in any given year, right? That's what we've seen. Yeah. So I have a question on your on your projection table. So mm -hmm. however you judge the, the yep. retirement, is, is what kind of rolling average is that a three year five something like that? Because if we have a let's say we have a, a year where mm -hmm. a big percentage of our school and municipality people retire all at once, mm -hmm. do we see that hit or is that kind of leveled out over time? It's leveled out over time. It is. Okay. Yep. All right. So what kind of what kind of time frame is that typically? Like a three or five year rolling average? No, <laughs> it's, it's a long. It's yeah. long. Way longer than I've, okay. I've looked at the actuarial formulas. Yeah. I'm not a mathematician, 
I mean, it's, it's like 20. Yeah. Okay. Things are okay. basically covering the lifespan. Right. Yeah, well, life expectancy yep. of those that are right. Okay. Yeah. So they, they have formulas of based on the census, and then they try to estimate How what they think, and then live. some people outlive it and some won't, and mm -hmm. that has an effect on it as well. So my point is that this, is, this will grow steadily over time, but it's not, we're not going to see a catastrophic impact, like say in two or three years this is going to jump to seven or some, seven million or something like that over all at once. We hope not, but I, I don't know. You know yeah, I don't know. The situation will be uh, how market the funds runs. are investing their money. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So it's entirely out of control. Okay. Yeah. And uh, NamePers website has all the information on the the main first pension and the audit reports and the actuarial reports as well. And most of the information that we get and put in our financials is directly from mm -hmm. their information yep. and their auditors. Their auditors yep. And uh, if you wanted to read up a little bit on this, it's on pages 66 through 72. So. <laughs> So, the next one. Um, if you have any, any other questions, anything we haven't touched upon that you have questions regarding? We're in good shape. Yes. 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 No. Nope. Nope. It's good shape. Um, you know, the financial statements. We didn't, like we said, you know, unmodified opinion, clean opinion, no, uh, no uh, real, no big <laughs> items to report, just some little process improvement items. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for our auditors or the manager? Sorry, Tom, did we, um, did we ask at some point, I think, through finance to get like a best practices kind of recommendation or something, or was that a different... I, I don't call the top of my head, it was an RFP or something metrics, we were putting out? Metrics. That was for metrics. That was part of the conversation we had with uh, renewing our contract with Matt Page. Uh, I think it's probably time we sit down and mm -hmm. have that conversation. Yep. Okay. Yeah, Chris, Christian mentioned that the other day. Okay. That was part of so, it. So maybe we have him back to I'll town to finance. We can schedule him for a finance meeting. Yep. Okay. That'd be great. Great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And, uh, You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. of the 2016 Municipal and School Audit. So I to, while they're leaving, I want to thank the school board members and the school staff and our auditors. And with that, we will move into um, order number 17-011, 7 o'clock public hearing and action on the new request for a massage therapist license from Tammy Barrows working at Synergy Studios located at 306 U.S. Route 1, D-4. Uh, with that, I would like to open it up to the public hearing, if anybody in the public that would like to speak on the item can go to the podium. No? Going once, going twice. We'll close the public hearing and um, is there a motion on the floor? Move approval is presented. Second. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm assuming, because um, uh, it's been asked um, that all items are in order since it has been recommended by the town clerk. Any questions or comments from council? Not seeing any, I would uh, move the question. All in favor? And that is unanimous. Old business, there's none at this time. New business, order number 17-012, act on the request to set the warrant and appoint the warden, set the hours for voter registration, and act on appointments of election and ballot clerks pursuant to chapter 
Article sorry, seven, eight. Sorry, um, Article eight. Uh, nomination and elections and <coughs> authorize the town clerk to make any additional appointments as necessary for the special municipal election scheduled for Tuesday, February 28th, 2017. I'll open that up to any public comments. Would anybody like to speak on the item? Going once, going twice. Thank you. We'll close the public comments. Um, a motion from the council. Move approval. Second. Okay. Any comments, questions for the clerk or the manager? Not seeing any, all in favor. And that is unanimous. Item number nine is standing and special committee reports. Um, I'll start with Councilor um, Donovan. Uh, planning board. Uh, the uh, contract zone public hearing was held in front of the planning board uh, the, earlier this week. Uh, 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 there was uh, uh, an endorsement. Uh, uh, of the project, it was uh, uh, pretty much presented as uh, we like what we're seeing. We're going to give it a very vigorous review, uh, uh, and uh, and uh, we'll see how it comes out at that point. The project's uh, luxury standards were uh, emphasized by the applicant and the likely low school impact uh, was a point of emphasis in the presentation as well. Uh, so that was uh, what the planning board heard. Uh, pest management uh, met this week, uh, discussed their community education program, uh, soils testing. They now have five years of data, sort of. Uh, I think some, some of the years may be a little less uh, up to date than others. Uh, they did an update on the South Portland uh, uh, organics program, uh, and Tom and I talked about the sustainability quarter, uh, coordinator getting involved, so there's more to come on that. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Chiazzo. Uh, so appointments uh, met today, but we're trying to institute a new process. It threw me off a little bit too. I yeah. totally wasn't ready. I'm trying to trying to. <laughs> kind of have here. some excitement tonight. <laughs> trying to recover. Um, so we're going to try and develop a new process. Uh, we, we we touched on it briefly at the last session. And moving forward, what we'd like to do is is have the um, the individuals that that apply for positions on committees have the uh, applications be sent to the committee chairs for review, uh, and then possible comment before we as a appointments committee decide to recommend them or, or, or take action on them. So um, with this new set that came in, we're going to um, send them out to the respective committee chairs um, and then follow up to see if there's any comment. If not, we'll be addressing their appointments at the following meeting, which uh, we're trying to be consistent and, and, and meet a half an hour before our regularly scheduled uh, regular council meeting. So if we have a workshop, let's say if it's 5.30, we'll meet at 5. If we have a regular schedule, it'll be 6.30. So, um, the other thing that we're looking at is possibly changing the, the purview of the, of the committee itself. Um, and I'd like to uh, possibly invite Ch uh, Chairman Baybine and uh, Tom to our next meeting to maybe kind of help us flesh out um, what that might look like and maybe some verbiage around uh, how we want to present that uh, and then certainly bring that back either through rules and policy or uh, for a, a, a run through and then for full uh, council approval. Uh, whatever changes we decide to try and make or, or however we like to do it. Um, Long-range planning uh, didn't meet, but we have a, a meeting Monday at 8. Um, transportation meeting met, uh, transportation met last uh, night. I missed that because uh, I didn't follow up on the calendar, so that's, I apologize for that. Um, but I'm, I'm on the email exchange now, so hopefully I won't, I won't miss the next one. Um, PACS <laughs> met, um, uh, Portland area trans, uh, transportation Comprehensive training uh, transportation system. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> met uh, last week and talked about the regional um, bonded projects that are coming through the pike. Um, the only ones I think I saw for Scarborough were some Eastern Trail uh, improvement things. Mm -hmm. um, but a follow-up um, <coughs> uh, that uh, I'm not sure staff is aware of uh, either yet. I'm sure they are. But uh, they, they have their new bike path trails. Uh, so they've what they're trying to do, uh, PAX is trying to fund regional um, um, bike locations, not just on like trails, on regular streets that would say something like, here's where you are um, to 
if you're on Route 1, let's say Scarborough Center is this direction, this number of miles. South Portland is this direction, this number of miles. Uh, so they're, they're working through it. I, and the demo actually was Scarborough's, um, which was um, looked look very, very nice and, and sharp. They're not huge because they're supposed to be for pedestrians and bicyclists, not for cars. Um, but I did note, um, I, looking for some clarification too, possibly from, from uh, staff, it mentioned Scarborough Center. Uh, I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm not sure if that was a geographical center or <laughs> if there's a, a, an actual center of town. So um, that they, they, were, they, were, they, they conveyed to me that it was somewhere between uh, Pleasant Hill and, and uh, Gorham Road, I believe, or something like that, which didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. So maybe before they go to print, we'll follow okay, up on we'll, that. Yeah. But yeah, we'll find out. So, so that's all I have. Thank you. Councilor Rowan? Um, so I didn't have any committees meet, um, but there was an article in today's uh, newsletter regarding the uh, the senior uh, activities program. They're having an event on Valentine's Day. Uh, looks very nice. So uh, 55 plus, if you're looking for something to do on Valentine's Day, I say check it out. Great, thank you, um, Councilor Hayes. Yeah, just a quick update. The joint finance committee meeting between the town council and board of education met on the 19th of January. It was kind of an organizational meeting. We talked a little bit about norms, which are really just a carryover from last year. Um, we did approve sort of a budget meeting schedule and adoption schedule. That's kind of up on the website now, so everybody knows when the meetings and where they're going to be and what times. We talked a little bit, started to talk a little bit about anything on the horizon for budget drivers that we were looking at that may have an impact. Um, Certainly there's a lot of uncertainty around what the state funding might be um, with everything that's going on in Augusta and also some uncertainty about whether that will even be announced by the time we have to conclude our process. Talked a little bit about contracts. We also talked about strategic planning and really trying to look out more than just one year and trying to balance the one budget approach, the different things that are out there. Um, Upcoming meetings, some possible agenda items we're talking about, and we are meeting next week on Thursday at 2. We talked a little bit about are there some things that we can do as kind of, you know, sharing resources around communications, other way that we can communicate together, looking for op those opportunities to collaboration, maybe things around grant writing and some other things. So that was sort of just our kickoff meeting. and. The second update would be the public safety update. The public safety process is working forward. There's been a series of site visits to the surrounding police and fire stations. And actually this week the process was undertaken by which the, the selection of a consultant to kind of help us find a location, plan what we're going to need for space and those types of things was determined. And I think they're in the process of being notified, may have already been notified. Um, I think they're going to actually try to be at our meeting next Wednesday morning at 8. So that's just a quick update for, for me. Thank you. Uh, Council Foley? I wasn't sure which way you were going. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, no committees met uh, <laughs> since our last meeting, but we do have some upcoming meetings that I wanted to share. So the Conservation Commission will meet February 13th at 7. Uh, the Eastern Trail Alliance will meet February 16th, and that I believe is at I'll have to check the website again. I think that's 4 p.m. Um, and then we've set our first rules and policy committee meeting for February 28th. Um, and I think we got a great agenda item from one of our citizens tonight. So I'm uh, looking also for input from anybody else. Uh, also waiting for both appointments and the communication committees to meet so that I can get going on some pieces and how we can assist you as Chris alluded to. That's it. Thank you. I'll say clear. Thank you. Um, moving on, I have one just for the library. I wanted to hand out um, a really, really nice article that Nancy uh, gave us. One, two, three. Um, that she wanted me to share with you. It's um, ICMA, which is the, if I get this correct, um, International County and Municipal Association. International County and City Managers Association. Okay, there we go. And it's a study that reveals five areas where public libraries can support community goals. And um, I thought it would be really nice uh, to share that with you given our workshop last week, um, or Monday, sorry, given our <laughs> workshop Monday on the issue. So I wanted to share that with you. And that is my only um, committee um, report or liaison report at the moment. Um, moving on to item number 10, the Town Manager's Report. Yes, thank you. Uh, we are well underway uh, hiring two department managers, that's community services director position and assessing. Uh, we actually completed first round interviews today for community services director, very pleased with the 
quality of candidates, and uh, we'll be conferring on Friday the, the interview panel uh, to hopefully shortlist that uh, group down, and we may be doing second interviews as soon as next week. So we're very interested in moving that forward. Assessing is a bit further out. Uh, we're in the solicitation phase. Uh, resumes are starting to trickle in, and I'm hopeful. We'll put it that way. Um, I'm also having conversations with other colleagues to see if there's opportunities for sharing and partnership. And I've uh, requested a proposal from Cumberland County for them to provide these services. So we should have a full range of options in front of us. And uh, uh, do recall that this appointment is a council appointment, unlike any other. And so I'll be looking to include the chair and certainly the full council as we move closer. But uh, I want to provide as many op options for you to consider as possible. Uh, do recall that this weekend uh, at the Oak Hill Fire Station, February 4th, uh, from 10 to 12, there is the uh, fuel rally. This is done in partnership with Project Grace. In fact, they're the real coordinators of the event. We help support it. Uh, it's been a, a great fundraiser for us in the past, and we expect good things this year as well. And finally, I just wanted to comment on a uh, town employee, longtime employee that passed away last week. Uh, Jim Crowley uh, worked for this town as long as I am old. And I used to say that when I was a younger manager and it wasn't as meaningful, but he worked for the town for f 50 years. And it's just a remarkable thing. Um, uh, Jim was uh, is a lifelong Scarborough resident, just salt of the earth. Um, I wish we had 25 more like him. Uh, he lived for work. He lived for this town. Uh, I was um, pleased to attend the, the service forum, and there was an uh, overflow crowd. Uh, he clearly touched a lot of folks. Uh, there were cheers. There, were, there was laughter. Uh, it was really well done, and I was pleased to be part of it. And uh, Jim just exemplifies um, really what's special about this town. And, um, and uh, though he was sick at the end, he, uh, he really refused to leave work. We had to encourage him, too, for his own safety and, and health, um, but just such a commitment to this town and certainly noteworthy. Where did he work in what department? I'm sorry, uh, he was yep. in public works, okay. uh, lifelong in public works, started, uh, I think he did a couple years of service uh, and then has been with us ever since. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? <clears throat> no, thank you. And moving into the last item before um, adjournment, council member comments, and I will start with Council Chiazzo. Um, so I, uh, Tom, Tom stole a little bit of thunder. I did get a request from from um, uh, from, from Steffi to um, remind about the the fuel um, fuel rally at, at Oak Hill from 10 to noon. One of the things that I'll, I'll touch upon that Tom didn't mention um, it's the fifth year. They're trying to raise 15,000, um, and uh, there are clink bags available here, uh, and I know others. Uh, I, I don't know if there's any around town as well, but certainly there are some here for those in the audience who, who are still left. Um, they raised nearly 11,000, um, um, excuse me, 1,100. Um, that way for the fuel fund this year and only about 13,900 to go. And there's also, I believe, a matching, um, uh, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, there's a match somewhere as well um, by um, Eddie, Eddie Wooten. Eddie Wooten. Yeah. Wooten. Sorry, excuse me. Um, so, um, please show up. It's for a good cause, and uh, that's all I have for comments. Thank you. Councilor Hayes? No, I'm all set tonight. Thank you. Councilor St. Clair? Um, yeah, I just want to mention that the Governor William King Lodge is um, doing their annual fundraiser for the Wentworth Intermediate Fight for Books campaign. Um, I think that our, uh, my son, our foundation, um, donates to every year. Um, we're actually hoping to donate six bikes, six, probably four to six bikes this year. Um, but they're doing it by a GoFundMe page. I've listed it on my council page. It's really easy to donate, but it's a really great program where they're really trying to help kids, give them another reason to read. And for some of these kids, it's really the only way for them to get a bicycle. Um, a bicycle and a helmet, um, protective gear is supplied with a bicycle. It's a pretty, really great program. Um, and basically, if the kids read a certain amount of books, they get put into a drawing. Um, but obviously, the more bikes that we can bring into the school, the more chances these kids have to earn a bike. And so I just wanted to make sure people know about that. They're able to, with a, with a, um, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot the word, but anyway, with um, a program that they work, they've worked out with the bike department, 
these bikes are being donated at cost. So pretty much if you donate $75, you're giving a bike and a helmet to a child. Um, and I think that's a pretty low number, uh, low cost to provide a bike for a kid in this community um, and also encourage them to read, which is, you know, is a battle for some of these kids. So. Council Foley? Um, two things. Uh, one, just wanted to, uh, while well, the goals workshop on Monday was primarily a, a rear view look, um, I appreciated the opportunity to hear uh, what all of you had to say about how last year went and what your hopes are for kind of looking at that and some of those things going forward. So um, appreciated that opportunity and that workshop and we're going to have another. Um, secondly, I just wanted to offer uh, a little clarity on a comment that was made earlier um, because I don't take it personally. I actually take it as uh, I'm embracing it and I'm excited about it because it's actually something that I feel we can uh, make change. But the comment was in regards to uh, a council decision, if you will, whether or not to allow a council member to speak for on behalf of the whole council. I think had we had, as she suggested, a policy in place ahead of time, then there wouldn't have been any confusion at all. Um, and then we would have been able to act in a different way. So uh, I'm going to follow for that person with coffee, hopefully, and hopefully that can be an agenda item for rules and policy um, because I think that was a simple fix. Um, but there was more to it than all of that. It wasn't, you know, and I just want to make sure the public is clear about that. So thank you. How about uh, Rowan? Um, so I wanted to start by thanking um, Chris uh, for going up to Augusta on Monday and, and uh, giving it the old college try uh, to support that bill. Um, and also, um, I'm sure Jackie and, and uh, Julie are watching avidly, but uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> as well as um, to um, um, Senator Volk uh, and Representative Siraki and, and Bashan for supporting that bill. Um, I think that um, um, it probably has a snowball's chance, but it's um, it would be a material, make a material, material difference to our town and uh, we did the right thing and we're doing the right thing um, and we should be not punished for it. Um, the other, um, my other comment uh, was uh, I have something for you um, for rules and policy. I'd really like to, to um, uh, see us um, revisit our, our um, the committees that we have in town. I think we might have talked about this, Sean, but uh, one thing where I think we're lacking is like a lot of towns have a multicultural and diversity committee, mm. um, and it's something that we don't have. And if you look down our list of committees, we don't have a group of people in town that are talking about issues about, you know, whether it's appropriate to have, you know, a, a tree lighting ceremony with Santa Claus that might be exclusive to um, certain religions or, or um, um, you know, kind of accessibility around. Um, uh, you know, a new American and immigrant community, uh, as well as I, I, I had put in uh, in our goal sessions um, around um, accessibility to individuals with disability. That would be another form of diversity that could be addressed by a group of people that would sit around and focus on this thing, on <coughs> that type of issue, um, as well as you know, influenced by recent events as well. But I think it's Section 302 that you'd have to modify. That's all. We I have. have to take a look at that. Council Donovan. Uh, I missed the last meeting, uh, first one in a long while, but uh, I did watch it live streaming. Saw all of you. You looked very good. Uh, uh, but I did want to give you my, my sense of the uh, 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 housing reserve permits, the multifamily permits. Uh, uh, to me, the, some of the key things here is it's a real diversity of housing that's coming in. The senior, there's some Avesta, there's 600 of these 800 odd units are characterized as luxury apartment buildings, uh, uh, attracting young professionals, uh, empty nesters, uh, I think many of whom will be Scarborough residents. So uh, I was very positively inclined by the expectation that these were going to attract good people, that it is going to be a money maker for the town of Scarborough. Uh, uh, the uh, demographics that's attracted to these 600 units is not, uh, if they can afford these units, they're buying a house or they're renting a house. Uh, and so uh, 
I was impressed by the likelihood that this will be a very successful uh, undertaking from the town's financial point of view. Uh, I wanted to just remind myself that we preserved an historic uh, building, Southgate, here as a part of all of this, uh, and it's a real boost to Higus Parkway. And those are all, I thought, really strong reasons why we needed to move. It's a bubble also. I think we heard that from Rocky Rosbera. Uh, and the time to move is now. Take advantage of it. It's going to be short-lived. It will get built out. And then we'll have another dry spell like we did from 2006 to 2017 where virtually nothing got built in the way of multifamily housing. So uh, I thought that was uh, worth at least expressing my, uh, my point of view on that. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, the uh, Ordinance Committee is going to meet on Thursday, first Thursdays of the month at 4 p.m., trying to schedule it late in the afternoon so people can attend. The agenda is out. Uh, a marijuana moratorium uh, is front and center on the agenda, and we'll take that right up. That should uh, 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 be back to this council soon. Fireworks is on the agenda. Uh, Pine Point Road uh, parking near East Grand Avenue. Uh, Angela Benchett uh, has given us an extensive memo uh, on that, uh, uh, and that will be, uh, I think, well received. Uh, I think there was a comment by uh, one of the speakers earlier about uh, negotiating, and I spent a lot of hours with the people down at Pine Point, and they knew and do know and are not confused one bit about uh, what the town manager and I did in the limited discussions we would had with the Gendron representatives. They were at every turn trying to present to us something that we would find attractive. But we always made it clear, and I always made it clear to the Pine Point people, that I did not have any authority to negotiate. We did not negotiate. Uh, but we certainly were happy to accommodate the gender and representatives telling us what they would like to do and what they thought we would want to hear. Uh, in the way of landscaping and things of that nature. But uh, we never engaged in any negotiations because we had no authority. And now, at this point, I think the council has spoken pretty clearly. Let's see if, if we can make a deal that would actually make everybody happy. I, I think the Pine Point community is divided uh, on their view, but uh, the one thing they're very focused on unanimously is preserve public access, and that's something I think we can do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have actually a few comments, so a few of them are very brief, but I'm going to take them a little slow because I want to make sure I speak the right words. Uh, the quicker ones, um, wanted to mention that we had a workshop before tonight, um, before the regular meeting, so I do hope citizens um, look at it, um, watch it, and, and uh, if they have any questions, I know all of us are open to those comments and questions and, and uh, uh, considerations. Um, I did want to say thank you to everyone that participated um, in trying to organize that workshop. We were a little creative that in ways that we've never been before, such as inviting a particular group um, or that had an interest in this, particularly the Pine Point Residents Association. But I hope that the citizens keep in mind that that is, was a unique situation because while we invited them to the table, I also received criticism of why them and not me, and so it's about trying to find that balance while allowing more people to be involved in that conversation because not every resident, as an example, down at Pine Point agrees with the Pine Point resident's position um, as well as it kind of goes across the board no matter what part you're in. So um, I want to say thank you to the council for allowing me that creativity or that moment of creativity because I think it went extremely well. Um, of course, you always wish you had more time, but there will be more time for public input and public comments. So I hope people will keep uh, track of that. Uh, next, um, I wanted to um, thank Council Chiazzo as well as School Board Member Jackie Perry and the Superintendent of Schools, um, Julie Kuchenberger, for going up to Augusta and speaking. Um, just to be clear, um, just to reiterate, uh, uh, Ms. Perry sent an email asking if we would participate, we being 
Uh, me, I assumed it was on behalf of the council, um, although I am an individual as well. Um, and, uh, and, and Chris's involvement as an individual council, but also because of his uh, strong background around the schools, um, I view that as a personal request and not necessarily on behalf of the council. Um, I chose not to attend, one, because um, I had business requirements that this wouldn't allow it. But to be honest with you, I don't know if I necessarily agreed with the bill. Um, and didn't feel comfortable going up to speak on behalf of the council when I'm not sure if I agreed with it. And the reason why I don't agree with it is because it does not change the amount of money that's going into the pot that truly is what the problem is. It reallocates the money that's already in there, which means it takes it away from another community and just reallocates it based on an, uh, a multiplier. Um, that doesn't fix the problem. It's the amount of money going into the formula that needs to be fixed. So. Um, I want to say thank you, Chris. I thought your words, I saw your written words um, when, that you spoke on. I thought they were eloquent um, and truly um, did represent um, uh, your views as well as I think even the, um, um, the town of Scarborough. So I'm, I'm okay with that and uh, appreciate it. Um, I also wanted to um, say thank you uh, to the council. We did have a meeting on Monday evening from 5 to 7 in which we talked about our goals as a council um, just to highlight uh, the first part of that session was to review last year's goals and come to an agreement on where we um, reflected and where we are. Um, if I was to summarize it um, in four words, it was a positive reflection with also a promising future and setting goals for the new year that we're going to finish up um, as, it, uh, as that information progresses and I will get to work on that as I promised. Also want to thank um, the um, members of the school board on the audit. Um, I did want to make one comment because uh, Ms. Perry did make a statement and said, um, which was positive. She said that we are in a good position and the accountants agreed. I do want to keep in mind that while we are in a good position, um, any change in that position is dependent, both good and bad, is dependent on the policies and the decisions that we make as a town council. Um, so we have to be mindful of our role in that. It's not just a financial situation. It is policy driven. Um, and I know that we're going to be good stewards. Um, Sorry. Um, absent, oh, town clerk want, gave me this one in my ear. Um, wanted to mention that absentee ballots are available at the town hall. Um, so please come in and vote. Um, even though it is a single issue, which is a, to fulfill a vacancy on the school board, it's a very important issue. There is only one person running. But still, I think the community needs to come out and support uh, her, as well as um, having a decision in that as well. So please vote um, and vote often. Um, no kidding, right? Um, sorry. So I, um, a couple of things. One is I just wanted to clarify some comments that were made about process because it's um, reflective, I think, of my leadership as a chair. Also, because um, I try to be as flexible and as meaningful as possible in everything that I do um, as chair to represent everyone equally. But there's a couple of things that I wanted to point out. First is. Um, the issue around the reconsideration process and how it was undertaken, um, there seems to be some notion that um, um, preferences weren't given, if that's the right word, it might not be the right word, that a process might not have been undertaken, that there was some, some other process that should have been undertaken. Um, I tried to be a champion around the rules and policies to understand it because that's how we have to run the meeting. So um, just to reiterate, um, I strongly believe that it is, unless you ask me to do something, it is your responsibility as a counselor to make sure that you are represented and you get what you want. Um, w regarding the reconsideration, when the initial vote was taken, the direct comment was made was, I reserve my right to put it back on the agenda. I took that to mean that that person would be responsible for taking the time to make sure that the rules and policies were followed, such as submitting it on Wednesday, um, by 2 p.m. before the next meeting, or doing what happened tonight, which was asking for reconsideration. So the process was followed, the process was um, honest, and the process um, worked the way that it is intended to work. So I hope there is no question about the process that was undertaken. Um, my vote is my vote, and I believe I explained why my vote is, um, and so I hope that we respect the fact that we can all disagree. Um, the other piece is that um, lately it seems that um, Communication has been a very, very strong focus. It's a very strong focus of our goals. It's a strong focus of comments from citizens. And there's two pieces that I think that need to be brought up. First is that there is a significant amount of misinformation and misleading information that, you know, we kind of joke about it in today's political environment because of things happening on a national level about alternative facts 
or things that are tr just untrue about what is happening on the town council and what's happening in this community. And I just, um, I really hope that everyone is cautious because, first of all, I only worry about the comments that come out of my mouth because I want to make sure they represent who I am. I really don't pay attention to the style or the words that are used by others because I have absolutely no impact. I mean, there's people, we all know this, there's people that no matter what you say, and you can be the nicest person, they're going to yell at you, they call you names, they try to degrade you in order to manipulate the conversation, um, and, or they change their tone or whatever it might be. So, you know, we've been focusing as a council, particularly through the chair, about other people's conversations and other people's communications. And I just want to ask that I think that this needs to be a time until we set our goals that we each individually kind of worry about the comments that we're making on our own and allow other people to worry about theirs. Um, and if you have an individual problem with someone's communication, we have a responsibility to go to that person um, and address that. We are grown adults, um, and that's how relationships are formed by having that discussion. Um, so I hope that we kind of take that into consideration going forward. Um, last, regarding, I'm, I'm glad that, the, um, that Council Donovan brought this up, but the last issue is around, the question is about honesty and negotiations. Um, uh, while I do, like I just said, I do focus more on my own words, um, I am 100% honest. I can tell you right now, we have not negotiated anything. The process is followed today is the same process that was followed in 2000 when other people who've been in our audience and made comments for Council is at this table as well. When a citizen has a request and has something that they want to do, whether it's a landowner, a business interest, or whatever it might be, they go to our chief administrative officer who has the resources to determine whether or not it's something this town does. That's what happened with Jenner and that's how it was approached. They do not come to the town council and ask the town council to make its decision first or whether or not to go through that process. They go to staff. Staff followed their process by looking at the issue, determining where there are any gaps, whether or not it can be done, whether or not they did their own research, they did their own initiation, they had their own conversations. And every person I talked to, including the town's attorney who sat here and said, no one negotiated on behalf of the town because they did not have the authority because no direction has been taken. So nothing has been negotiated. Um, have they had conversations about what could happen? Absolutely. Have we shared with them the comments that we received from the citizens? Absolutely. Have we shared with them the outcomes that came from the two public sessions that we had? Absolutely. That is the process. That's not sinister. That is not um, somehow being dishonest. Um, it is all upfront and public. The sessions that we've had in a, uh, the executive sessions have been very clear. I spoke to that issue um, as chair at one of my meetings or one of these meetings, and I stated, we go in executive sessions for legal purposes. And in this particular case, the legal purpose is about a negotiation um, regarding whether or not, um, I shouldn't say a negotiation, it's about interpreting of the legal opinion that we received, and that is something that we decided to go into. Secondarily, what we choose to share with the public, um, I think, is leading to that level of transparency that we have many councillors constantly asking that we do more of, and which citizens are too. So to me, it's kind of um, this duality of um, you're not being transparent, and then you, we get a comment that says, oh, you, but you shouldn't be telling me this information. So uh, you know, which, which end of the stick do we want to go on? But I think that we are acting in good faith. I think we're doing a very good job, and we are communicating when we can, and it's appropriate. Otherwise, our manager would tell us, you really shouldn't be discussing this because it's a legal issue. So I'm very happy with that promise um, or with that process. And I want to say that I believe that every person I serve with and every person I've served with in the past has been open and honest, and we do do the best for this town. So I want to say thank you to all of you for doing that. Um, with that, um, I don't think I had any other announcements. Um, take the motion to adjourn. Move adjourn. Second. Um, actually, it's not a debatable. Oh. All in favor? <laughs> I think it had to be debated. Like thank you. Go. Unanimous. I'd like to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, let's